at law. Um, had the good fortune that um, Peter and his staff found me in the ready room uh, because time and those sorts of things have a tendency to kind of escape. So I'm up doing um, Trusted Voices, Google Live. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some legal issues that we're facing uh, in the fire service. Um, we're gonna have a guest, uh, probably in about 10 minutes will be Dr. Beth Murphy, who we're closely related and uh, by marriage, of course. And we're gonna be talking about uh, presumptive illnesses and mental illness. And so that's gonna be a topic for the, in, in about 10 minutes. But for right now, um, we have uh, three other attorneys that we will um, do blog radio shows. Uh, Brad Pinsky, who's teaching a class uh, presently on policy. Uh, Kurt Verone uh, from Providence, Oda, uh, Rhode Island, retired uh, fire chief. Um, he uh, will do be doing a class on um, um, thinking, I'm not really sure what he's doing. And then uh, Chip Comstock is the other attorney in our, our uh, group of attorneys, fire service attorneys. And he'll be doing a class uh, Thursday afternoon on um, fire legal issues and especially around uh, the First Amendment. Uh, today, I had the good fortune uh, to teach a class, a uh, four hour pre-con class. And we talked about seven different uh, issues affecting the fire service. Uh, the first one is social media, uh, which there's a number of firefighters that are committing this sort of career suicide by putting crazy stuff on the on your social media site, pictures, uh, complaints about the department, and um, under the social media rules and regulations, which your department should be having, it's a policy issue about what can be put on social media, what are my restrictions, and then that sort of conversation morphs over into my, what my First Amendment rights are. So under your First Amendment rights, obviously everyone in our country has a First Amendment right to free speech, uh, but it's fairly limited in the fire service. And so uh, in the fire service, there are some limitations in private service. You really don't have any rights of free speech and the employer can regulate you know, the speech um, uh, that originates from your, your uh, place of work. In public safety, uh, fire service is certainly a part of that. Uh, we do have some restricted rights under the First Amendment. Uh, in the late 60s, there was a case called Pickering versus the Board of Education, uh, which one of the teachers in the Cleveland School District articulated a complaint about how horrible the conditions were in school, the deplorable conditions of the building, the textbook material, the number of teacher-student ratios, it's sort of the same stuff we're having today. Uh, but what the teacher was complaining about was dismal conditions. And so the board of educators fired her uh, as a result of her public display of, hey, we need to do something here. And so she filed a lawsuit uh, for wrongful termination, uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made a decision based on what's called now the Pickering test, is that you have to be a citizen. And so uh, going to your board, uh, making a complaint about dismal conditions or apparatus issues or personnel issues, um, our advice to the rest of the attorneys who are not here is that you identify yourself as a citizen and then you're expressing a matter of public concern. So if it's uh, uh, one of the cases that we use today was a dive rescue team that got unbudgeted, a couple of kids died, uh, one of the members of the organization, the dive team went, it was complaining about um, the, you know, the lack of funding and we could have done a better job, got a little bit um, excited about it because he's very passionate. And then the department put, suspended him for three shifts. So he files a lawsuit under his First Amendment rights. And at the end of the day, the, uh, the court ruled using the Pickering test that yes, in spite of the fact that he was a firefighter, he had the opportunity to speak as a citizen. So you don't lose that opportunity if you're a firefighter in your community. We always advise the other ghost attorneys here that you essentially identify yourself as a citizen. And then the matter of public concern uh, in this instance was the dive rescue team. So the failure to fund the dive rescue team may have directly or indirectly um, led to the, you know, this young child drowning. Um, and so uh, he was fairly impassioned. Though it really didn't make a difference in the budget component of it. But the law indicates that yes, uh, as you speak as a citizen on a matter of public concern, then you have a first amendment uh, protection under the law. And so the judge said, certainly as a, he was a firefighter, yes, they identified that. But being the fact that there was a public concern issue, 
uh, they used the Pickering uh, test in order to uh, demonstrate the fact that he had every right uh, to speak in a public forum. Um, the other issue uh, that we get back to on social media is that um, a lot of departments, like there's a case in uh, Columbus, I think South Carolina, when the Black Lives Movement was um, you know, in full um, um, display, um, they're protesting on the freeway and he puts on his Facebook uh, that you know some dumb asses are gonna get run over if they're not off the freeway by the time he gets off to work. And so two of the fellow firefighters um, uh, gave the thumbs up sign, you know, we agree. Um, so he got fired, the two firefighters got fired. The um, a fourth firefighter brought a gun to work in violation of their gun policy. And so uh, he got terminated uh, based on a failure to abide by their policies. And at the end of the day, the fire department writes a policy on social media use. So I think the advice there is that we need to make sure that we do have our social media policies and all our policies in place uh, before you know we have, have to take action against the firefighter. Uh, Brad Pinsky today is talking about must have policies. And we talk about policies in pretty much all of our uh, discussions that the department has to have a good set of operational policies. Now policies are a little bit different than SOGs or SOPs or best practices. Policies are basically the bright line of this is how we expect you to conduct yourself while you're uh, on the job. And then if there's a violation of policy, there has to be some sort of discipline activities to correct behavior, to protect the other employees, and essentially uh, be able to manage uh, your organization in an orderly manner. The other documents that you should have are SOGs or SOPs, Standard Operating Guidelines or procedures. And those are generally used when you're out fighting a fire or you're doing some rescue operation or some operation that you cannot perform under a policy. So we talk about, can you fight a fire under a policy? The answer is no. Can you fight a fire under a guideline or a SOG or SOP or best practice? Yeah, you can because the dynamic of the situation requires a lot of latitude. And so those are our guidelines that we, um, hopefully that you have in your organization and as techniques and, and that sort of stuff changes, then you need to change those SOGs and SOPs or best practices in order to accommodate the changing in the fire climate or new technology or new apparatus or you know, whatever you have in your district, like new buildings or, or um, you know, threats, uh, potential threats in your organization uh, or in your community that you need an SOG that's dynamic and relatively changed relatively fast. One of the other uh, big issues that we're seeing in the fire service is discipline. Um, and so we need to make sure you have a good discipline policy, that it's a progressive discipline. Uh, so it goes from verbal warning all the way up to termination if you have to get there with various stages in between. And then the fact that you, know, you may have a discipline process that um, uh, we need to take a look at the employee. So in today's class, I talked about, well, you have a sterling employee that's been amazing for the last 15 years and all of a sudden he comes to work intoxicated or under the influence of something and so i think be, we have to look beyond the immediate well we need to um, evoke a, dis a discipline action against him and then take a look at the person you know is the person who's been a sterling performer for 15 years all of a sudden his performance declined is there behavioral health issues going on we're going to have dr beth Murphy here um, as our guest in a few minutes but she talks about behavioral health issues and we're gonna talk about presumptive illnesses and especially in the areas of mental health. Uh, but that's a later discussion. But I think for this employee, we need to look beyond the immediate symptoms and signs and look kind of deeper into the personality of why, what's the change? Where did the change come from? And so instead of disciplining somebody, we can make some accommodations or adjustments or send them out for a fit for duty or a psychological fit for duty or those sort of testing process and not even get to a discipline process. Uh, discipline, if you do discipline and we don't do discipline very well, again, hardly anybody ever raised their hand and say, I do great discipline, except for one person in the class today who that's what she does. Uh, that's what her business is, is to do discipline uh, in a large organization where she be, has become the expert in administering and, and um, uh, facilitating a, a proper disciplinary process. And so, uh, which is a good thing because again, we generally do horrible uh, discipline processes and people have a tendency to sue the department for wrongful termination or sue the department because they've been suspended or demoted. 
uh, which in you know the the lawyer terms, there may be a taking of a property right. So a property right is your job in some uh, organization. A property right is your rank and pay scale in an organization. So if you're going to demote somebody or take pay away or you're going to terminate somebody, you got to have a process and you have to make sure that the person is well represented uh, either by labor. Uh, there are some case, cases out there where uh, a Garrity right, for an example, which is a, a police case in New Jersey, indicated that you know this guy was questioned, Garrity was questioned uh, under the guise that they were doing the fact finding. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was actually a criminal charge and the stuff that he voluntarily gave up as far as information was used against him in this criminal case. He files a lawsuit, you know, uh, I'm not sure what the basis was, but they essentially used his own words against him to charge him with a crime. And so he filed a lawsuit and it came out with a guarantee rule uh, that said, you know, uh, the employer can't do that sort of stuff. Um, you also have the other rights of wine garden hearing and a right of representation. And then the louder mill hearing at the end of the day when uh, the department's going to evoke or put, to, you know, some disciplinary action like termination, those sorts of things. A louder mill hearing is giving you an opportunity to uh, express and articulate. Well, you know, there are facts here that were brought up in the investigation. There are facts here that you don't know about. So I'm going to relay those uh, in a louder mill setting or a louder mill hearing that can provide some uh, avenue to have your final voice. Um, and then any sort of discipline processes, uh, we need to make sure that you are um, well represented. And so even we had a bunch of volunteers and excuse me while I am um, slightly distracted here. Um, we had volunteers in our class that basically was were talking about, well, do volunteers have a right of representation? And um, the volunteers, there are none. And so um, um, because volunteers, you know, they've been construed to be not employees. There's a recent case law that says uh, there are employees because you have a certain number of volunteer uh, members in your organization or that they get some sort of a benefit. So if you provide retirement benefits or in New York, they have a low SAP length of service uh, program. Um, there is uh, the protections under the law against termination or adverse uh, legal action against you that would indicate that you have do have some protections under the law, even as a volunteer. So let me make a message here to Dr. Beth, um, top of escalator. And turn right, okay. We have a lost guest and we're sending somebody out to retrieve her. So um, volunteers do have rights. I always say volunteers are, are firefighters as well. And, and we have uh, one of my friends, Tom Merrill is giving a class later on um, professional volunteer fire department talks about 69% of all fire service in the, this country are provided by volunteers. And so one of the issues that we didn't talk about in my class, but certainly is a huge issue, I think in the fire industry is the recruitment and retention of, of, of volunteer firefighters. And that's a huge challenge, I think, to the fire service. The other thing we talked about uh, today was documentation and report writing, uh, which is very important for organizations to have good structured writing classes to teach your people how to write. And so we're having a generation of people that, that were pretty good writers, you know, my generation, the baby boomers, and then the next generation were fairly decent writers, but not the best in the world. And now we have a generation of writers that tweet and text. And so they have an entirely different language structure uh, that may not facilitate us as being a part of, of um, you know, the documentation process, which has to be done in real time, uh, right after the event. Um, it has to be accurate. It has to put, and I always say, uh, put me as the attorney in your organization into your shoes. So three years from now, when the lawsuit occurs and the event occurs, then um, when I read your writings, I want to be there. You know, um, I want to smell the smoke. I want to you know, hear the cries. I want to do all the stuff. And, that, and your writings will sort of do that um, sort of stuff that will help me to defend you uh, or, you know, people that are defending you uh, that you did the right thing at the right time. And so I kind of term that as an affirmative defense. So the affirmation that you did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons puts a great defense um, in your favor in spite of the fact that, you know, people 
who come in to sue you. Sometimes they fabricate stories. Sometimes they actually lie uh, to get a better um, outcome in the case. But the whole issue is um, uh, documentation is a cornerstone to a good legal uh, defense. And, and we're looking uh, to the fire service to make sure that that sort of stuff happens. Uh, sometimes uh, individuals need to take a writing class, uh, which is good. I know I, my kids went to college. Uh, they ended up um, uh, writing, uh, sending stuff uh, to my wife and I to review. And um, would, would you stand by for a second? Could you just respond to Beth on here? Uh, the text is open. Just, I told her to the top of the escalator and take a right at the bathroom. So, um, so anyway, sorry about the technical interruption. Uh, we're trying to get our guest here. She's wandering around the, wandering around. So anyway, um, so we're, we talked about the, 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 you know, the documentation, teaching a whole generation of how to write. Um, I got, my kids went to college, uh, graduated from high school. They sent papers home for my wife and I to read. It was like abysmal, uh, sentence structure, spelling, punctuation. And so, you know, we helped them go through the process of correcting their papers. But the reality is that they should have taken a writing class. Um, I teach, uh, I'm a distance learning instructor for the University of Florida, go Gators, um, that um, we do um, a lot of writing in the class. And so, you know, and the writing uh, is academic writing, so it's a different standard. Uh, they have to do citations under the APA style and the whole nine yards, which uh, you probably really don't care about. But the issue here is uh, there are sites out there, uh, like Purdue has a writing lab, Colleges have writing labs. There's a OWL, O-W-L dot whatever on APA style writing. I kind of put you into a website that helps you write better and write academically, uh, which is not, you know, a stretch of the imagination for our industry to write academically and correctly. Because again, uh, your documents are going to be um, brought out of archives. You're going to be using them when you get deposed or when you go to trial or opposing counsels going to use that, um, you know, as a hammer against you. So you want to make sure that your writings are accurate, they um, are well uh, constructed, the spelling's good, the punctuation's good, and all that sort of stuff. So documentation is extremely important. Um, the other thing we talked about today, too, is driving. And so, unfortunately, a couple of days ago, they had an accident in Phoenix, uh, Arizona, where three civilians got killed. Uh, three or four firefighters were, you know, severely injured. Um, in a motor vehicle accident uh, where apparently the fire truck had red lights and sirens requesting the right of way uh, and unfortunately hit this car and, and three people died, two adults and a small child. That's a tragedy. You know, it's a tragedy from every perspective. And so, um, you know, the driving uh, today was, you know, we do have laws that dictate um, how we drive, how we manage our apparatus on the, on the freeway or on the side roads. Uh, the law basically gives you permission to exceed the speed limit. Every state has this, basically the same law, but at the bottom, this sort of this disclaimer that indicates that you know you're responsible, right? You you have to use due care and caution to take care of the you know the civilians, the population that's uh, out there that we can say I'll put in harm's way. So driver education and driver training is, is extremely important. Also, doing documentation of the driver training. So. I look at what your record is. And so because you're involved in an accident, you know, there's a lot of investigative agencies will come in. You know, the prosecutor's office comes in potentially. NIOSH will come in and do, you know, a line of duty death investigation. Uh, a lot of investigor investigatory agencies that are taking a look at your documentation, certainly drivers and driver training and documentation all lends to the, the, uh, the you know, the story that you did the right thing, right? You did the right driver training. Your instructors were certified instructors uh, to administer whatever driver training uh, programs that you you happen to adopt. The other thing about driver training programs is you got to get your drivers out on the street. And so the guy who sits over in the right hand side is generally the officer. When you go into a call, this is a continual evaluation of driving skills, uh, especially for new drivers and even for uh, the guys that have been in the fire service for 10 years doing the driving component. So it's important that we document you know, ongoing driver training, the guy who sits in the right-hand seat uh, does the documentation on on uh, your driving skills. And so at the end of the day, it's going to protect uh, your organization. Now, unfortunately, um, the city of Seattle, hey, Dr. Murphy, how are you? I'd stand up, but I can't get out of the couch. <laughs> you finally found us. Oh, thanks. 
So um, talking about dri drivers, we'll get to the the, um, the other issue here in a couple of minutes. But talking about uh, in the city of Seattle, uh, there was just a $63 million judgment against the city of Seattle because uh, one of the eight cars T-boned a, um, a car in an intersection. Uh, the car was destroyed. The uh, occupant got significant head injuries. And at the end of the day, there was a $63 million uh, judgment for a couple of reasons. One, uh, she was a high profile attorney uh, in the city of Seattle, but represented on an international basis. And two, because of the brain injury, uh, we're talking about long-term care uh, for this patient, which is gonna be, and she's a young woman, will last a lifetime. So huge judgment uh, can, you know, we've made a mistake somewhere. And as my old friend, Gordon Graham always says, what's predictable is preventable. And so all of these sort of driving events predictable. And we know it's happened, it's going to happen be, you know, before, we know it's going to happen again, but you don't want to be the one that's sort of stuck up in that uh, predictable, preventable part when you're, you know, you, you T-pulling somebody or roll over an apparatus or an eight car um, uh, go into a call. And then uh, the last thing we talked about was nothing. The class ended. And for a lot of people after a four hour class, they go, yay. So we did okay. So, um, Hi. Hello. I'd like to welcome Dr. Beth Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy is a psychologist. She'll be teaching the class on uh, Thursday afternoon on behavioral health. Yes. And starting a peer, what is it? Yeah, kind of an overview of peer support, <laughs> of like the ideal peer support program and um, some of the components and what those are and where you might find them. So um, more, uh, it's just going to be kind of an overview. Okay. And um, and hopefully to get people thinking about what kinds of questions they need to ask. For peer support or? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So basically it's like what their department should be asking. Like, what do they need? Okay. So what do they need? So <laughs> yeah. your class is Thursday afternoon at 3.30 in room. I have no idea. <laughs> she has no idea. So look for Dr. Beth Murphy in the no idea classroom Thursday <laughs> afternoon at 3.30 and you'll get all of the <laughs> psychological assistance uh, that you could possibly need in 90 minutes. And then she does after session <laughs> consultations as well. So she's available for the rest of the week. We're leaving on Saturday. So um, the reason I wanted Dr. Murphy to come, oh, uh, just a little bit of background about her. Uh, retired firefighter from Bellevue Fire Department, she's a firefighter EMT. Uh, went, I uh, was going to school and completed her graduate work in as a psychologist, as a PsyD, as a small private practice. Well a big private practice uh, in Bellevue, Washington, dealing um, with firefighters, cops, uh, military, um, other people. Uh, focus is on trauma and uh, psychological trauma, does uh, EMDR therapy and lots of other things. Uh, but one of the things we're talking about today is um, in Washington state, we have a presumptive illness law. And so, and many states have presumptive illness laws. And so the presumptive illness would indicate that um, if you contract some sort of a disease, I think we're more focused on cancers, uh, you know, respiratory disease, heart disease, you know, the heart and lung sort of component. Uh, but cancers have been uh, pretty predominant lately in our industry. Uh, and now the state of Washington has allowed uh, PTSD um, as a, um, a covered uh, illness under the presumptive illness law. So one of the things that, you know, I have talked about, and I wrote an article for Fire Engineering Magazine a few months ago, is about documenting your presumptive illnesses. Uh, because the proof mm -hmm. is in uh, the narrative that you put forward, yes, that I was exposed to a particular, um, you know, insult, chemical exposure, fire exposure, heat, those sorts of things, uh, which caused my heart disease, which caused my respiratory compromise, which caused my cancers. And so... We see a lot of cancers in men, uh, brain cancer, prostate cancer, uh, skin cancer, lung cancer, those sorts of things. But one of the things we're not seeing in the presumptive illness, which needs to change, is women uh, having cancers of breast and ovary, uterine cancer, those sorts of things. And so our theory, I guess, is the fact that the theory is there's not enough women in the study uh, to affect you know, some significant change in the law saying that, you know, if you get brain cancer, I'm sorry, breast cancer or ovarian or uterine cancer, 
um, you know, how'd you get it? Uh, because women and men, you know, we get cancers and it's not necessarily that we're in the service to get melanomas or lung cancer or that breast cancer, those sorts of things. But I think being as a firefighter at incre increased risk of that. So the focus for Dr. Murphy here is the presumptive illness for mental illness, which is like too many illness words, but. That's right. Um, so I was just looking, I, um, I was actually, I found a chart because we'd been looking for information about what states have presumptive right. um, mm -hmm. illness laws for PTSD or um, mental health issues. And um, so on the IAFF site, uh, they actually have a list of states that have presumptive disability laws. And I was just counting <laughs> Um, and there's only 11 states that have some sort of presumptive illness um, disability law. Um, and, and they're not, so some of them are specific to PTSD. Some are uh, mental uh, injury or illness. And, um, and then there's a couple that are mental impairment. Mm. So, and then they also, you know, have the, uh, information regarding Canadian provinces and territories. And so Canada, all but two have um, presumptive laws. Mm. Nice. So <laughs> I'm like, are we on camera? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Room 103, 104. Oh, oh your class. that's where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So a, a brief commercial interruption. Uh, Beth's class is on <laughs> Thursday afternoon at 3.30 in classroom 103-104. Yes. All right. So be yeah. there yeah. and get psyched out. That's the that's the reason. Yeah, right. So anyway, so Canada so, has more, a little bit more advanced in recognizing the fact that um, firefighters, um, you know, may develop a mental disorder or PTSD mm -hmm. as a result um, of their job. Yeah. And a number of states here, only 11 so far, but mm -hmm. as we talk more about it, and I think that there are some pending legislation in other states about uh, presumptive illness that would incorporate uh, sort of the mental uh, aspects of our of our job. Yeah, and so they all have um, conditions around uh, when that would apply. So um, I I know we, we just had a conversation with Brad Pinsky, so I understand a little bit about New York State. So it sounds like theirs is actually a lot harder to um, get that uh, presumptive disability right. for PTSD. Um, I mean, I thought Washington was bad. <laughs> so um, I was just looking on, on my little list here that I brought up. So, um, so New York, um, they have mental injury. Hmm. And, um, and so that basically implies that you have a discrete event and then you have a reaction to it that then it, um, impairs your ability to work. Right. And so that would be an injury. So, and I don't know if they, um, if they're specifically would cover like that accumulative fact. Um, that was one of the things that in Washington state, you could get a, a workman comp claim and then there were a couple individuals that actually did go out on disability related to PTSD but the wording had to be very specific and they had to uh, refer to it as an injury mm -hmm. a uh, psychological injury and they had to point back to a specific event that was I believe within the previous three years right, right. and um, um, so the presumptive law was supposed to acknowledge that there's an accumulative effect. So um, because it's, uh, there's not always a real significant injury that kind of tips people over. Right. So if they're struggling, it's like you can, you can handle it and handle it and handle it until you can't. Right. And um, so, so this presumptive law allows for that accumulation effect. Um, but it's kind of convoluted for how you qualify for it. And so most of the states do have a, have certain um, qualifying rules. Mm -hmm. So Washington State, um, 
if you're in a department that has over 50 firefighters, then um, the expectation is that you had a psychological exam pre-hire. Right. And then um, you have to be in for 10 years. And then um, your PTSD has to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Which is interesting because PsyDs have well, more of the evaluative skills than probably a nurse practitioner or a psychologist. Is that no, I, I am a psychologist. No, a psychiatrist, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you? Where I are am you? a psychologist. Right. So PsyDs and PhDs are typically psychologists. I copy that. Yeah, so, um, but we're trained specifically in psychopathology right. and um, assessment and evaluation. So we're recognized um, at the front end as being um, like our opinion carries weight at the front end mm -hmm. but at the back end they're saying no you, mm -hmm. do, you don't get right you don't get yeah so you can do the entry level and we and we uh -huh. talked about this in the class today about bringing people on board onboarding them with different testing and stuff and part of that was regardless of the size of the <clears> organization the psychological test should be done to take a look at compatibility and character and the things that we talked about before um and it gives us a baseline if there are things that go sideways right so uh, down the roadway so it's basically you can take a look at how they came in because we've talked about mm -hmm. you know we, we bring great people in and we send shipwrecks yeah. out the door well, right so this is so this is interesting so this is um it's kind of at odds with um like the the code of ethics and the washington state law as far as um like records mm -hmm. for psychologists so um when i do a a pre-hire evaluation, all I give to the agency is um, basically a risk, um, a risk right. evaluation. Like so, no risk, medium well, risk, high risk? It'd be low risk, med low, medium, and high. Right. Yeah, because I couldn't say it was no risk. <laughs> but uh, so low risk, medium risk, or high risk. And that's just as far as like, is this person going to have problems with like working as a team? Are they, um, you know, likely to develop um, like uh, maladaptive coping strategies like alcohol and drugs, um, things like that, but I'm not diagnosing them. So they are not getting a, like they have no diagnosis mm -hmm. um, or they have this diagnosis or whatever. So the purpose of that is not to diagnose. So, um, but the purpose so would be that is kind of useless when you're looking at comparing it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is, is that, um, so the presumptive law says you have to be in for ten years before you could file for a PTSD disability. Well, Washington state law and the APA code of ethics only requires psychologists to keep records for seven years. Mm. So if I did a pre-hire evaluation that the records, the raw data, everything would be gone. So yeah, cause the only way you can compare like that post um, evaluation to the initial evaluation is to actually look at the, um, the assessment um, results. Right. So a physical injury is easy, right? For disability. I mean, lose a limb, lose an eye, right, yeah. those sorts of things. Those are pretty clear, you know, yeah. black and white, cut and dry. So when you have had a, a client come in, a uh, fire service, let's say a firefighter comes in, um, you talked about the language has to be very specific. Yeah. Right. So there has to demonstrate an injury, not just this sort of obscure mental component, but it, they have to declare it as an injury with certain signs and symptoms, right? Am well, that's how, that's how it used to be. So <laughs> okay. with the presumptive law, the um, PTSD can be an accumulation. So you can, you have a little bit more leeway to word it. But um, this is kind of an interesting thing, too, is that there are exceptions in, um, at least for Washington State. So, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, you know, like the other states that have it, if they have these specific exceptions also. But there are, are exceptions that relate to like it can't be because of disciplinary action 
in your, you know, like you're receiving discipline or you were reassigned and you don't like the assignment and it can't be, um, it can't be um, like issues with your supervisor. Um, and so a lot of times what I've seen is that people come into my practice and they had filed a claim and it was denied. Mm -hmm. But it, when I look at the cause, like, so in, when the person is reacting and they are distressed, they, I mean, they're not thinking clearly because when you're distressed, you're not, you're not thinking fully. Correct. So they go to um, file these claims and they describe what happened as, um, I, you know, I, uh, have been like at odds with my I was arguing with my captain or my my chief about you know do well okay so one guy specifically was about a job change so he was going to go from shift to days and um and there was a lot going on in his life and and basically he just he couldn't handle that but on the cause he put down it was because um, his employer didn't care about him and was forcing him to go to days. Right. So like, you can't so, take employees complaint. Right. And make that into a disability. So that was, I mean, it, like it was almost word for word for what one of the exclusions are. And so when it got reviewed, well, so when the doctor looked at it and then it was reviewed, um, she, you know, she left that and, um, you know, didn't talk to him about, well, what's, you know, like, why is this so hard for you? Right. Because, what he put down was not actually the cause. It was a symptom because when you are struggling with PTSD or a severe stress reaction, or even if you're calling it like a psychological injury, mm -hmm. um, you are, you're going to look to um, that tipping point. So Rhett and, and for the lay person, they would look at that as this is a cause mm -hmm. for someone who's trained in psychopathology and in evaluation, we would look at that as a symptom. Mm. Okay. So, cause that would be a pretty, well, pretty common symptom, like um, having interpersonal difficulties. Right. So words and, matter, right? You know, words matter. <laughs> yes. Kind of surprising. Yeah. They do in our industry. Well, and it's how, it's how you interpret those words too. So, right. and that's kind of, I mean, that's what I'm seeing. I've had several cases, police and fire actually, where they've they've been denied because of what was worded as the cause. And it and it's usually, it, they're stating the cause as a symptom. And so I would say that if anybody's listening to this and they're like, well, how do I, you know, I'm really struggling and I wanna, I wanna file a claim on, you know, a mental illness, um, you know, one is you have to know your state law, um, may not be available. Right. So you need to know, I mean, and if they don't have it as a presumption, they may still cover it, but it may be covered as an injury. Um, so they need to know that. Right. The other thing is, is that they also need to understand that sometimes what they may think is the cause is actually a symptom. And then they need to kind of look back, well, why can I not tolerate this exchange with my supervisor mm -hmm. why can't i tolerate this um shift in duty assignment um so and they they won't be thinking that way but they may you know they have to because if they're if they go see somebody who doesn't understand then they're going to end up getting denied right so the so the question i have is that does it have to be a seminal event Gonna be like a death of a child, mass casualty incident, personal injury while you're on the job, lose a limb. Is that could that be construed as some sort of a seminal injury that would cause PTSD, which may make you well, more eligible for? It could be. So I mean, to get diagnosed with PTSD, you have to have a specific type of trauma. So um, there, it's a criteria. Bad supervisor is not trauma, right? No, it's not considered a or trauma. shift change. It's not a yeah. trauma, a traumatic event. <laughs> but to a, to a psychologist, I mean, those <clears throat> interpersonal difficulties can be what we call like a little t trauma. So, like if you're being harassed and discriminated at work, for instance, um, that doesn't meet the 
the trauma definition for PTSD, it's a little t trauma. However, the symptoms from that, if it's this long-term pervasive stuff, mm -hmm. can look like PTSD just without the the big t trauma. Right. Um, however, you know, if you're a firefighter, then um, you have all those trauma exposures, and so um, if you have like in Washington State where it's now they look at accumulation, um, then it's then they'll look back through your career and 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 it's just the nature of the job. Right. So you'll have those traumas. So you don't necessarily have to say, well, this I I mean, yes, I've been discriminated and harassed. Right. But that would not be what you want to put on your claim. Right. So, so words matter, right? Yes. The other, the other uh, thing I think is important that is, uh, you know, keeping documentation. So sometimes, um, you know, we don't even think about documenting these events because they're like a nothing deal. It's like, we see this, uh, you know, I was affected by it, but you know, I'll get over it. I get counseling or people, you know, saying, well, just put your big boy panties on and, you know, carry on. Uh, I, I think our okay. service is kind of changing in its, sort of response to these sort of events. So somehow we need to set up some process or program that people understand that, you know, if there's an event, you need to document it, right? So if you're looking at, because what you said is they look back through your record for accumulated trauma, and most people don't do that. I mean, most people don't document that sort of stuff. So your record, your personnel file uh, or event file has got nothing in it. Well, so the, um, I mean, the, uh, the that trauma piece, it was, it was actually re rewritten in the DSM-5, which is our diagnostic Bible. And it, um, it, it was changed to reflect just the, the job of first responders. Mm -hmm. So you only have to witness it. So, so you don't have to document that because it's just assumed that you're exposed to all these things. Mm -hmm. um, and any firefighter, will tell you, and I'm sure you know, and I know, it's like you have memories of significant calls, right. you know, whether you're struggling or not, you remember. Um, now, if you are someone who is experiencing um, harassment and discrimination, then um, you want to, you want to actually have your reaction to that documented by going to see someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then that is a way to kind of work with, um, the symptoms that arise from that. Right. And, uh, and then you have those traumas anyway, right. by virtue of the job. Well, that's a, that's a good point. I think then, because when I talk to women firefighters or minority firefighters that have been under this sort of constant unrelenting harassment, that's the small T, the small trauma, mm -hmm. but it's an accumulated trauma, right? It is. And it then is. To try to seek you know, care and treatment or remediate the issue at work by filing a complaint, those sorts of things. So from a lawyer's perspective on workplace harassment, it's like we need to take better care of our people. Um, there are laws in place to make that happen. Uh, we need to make sure you apply the law and uh, your policies to pre prevent that sort of stuff. Um, occasionally, uh, when I have somebody call me, I say, you know, are you seeing somebody? You know, are you seeing a counselor? Because workplace harassment, bullying, you know, uh, those sorts of things um, create a stress. Is it the, and can create a PTSD sort of reaction, right? Right, yeah. So then it makes the eligibility for a possible um, claim under your presumptive illness law that you're harmed at work. Well, yes and no. Okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so you can't claim that harassment and discrimination caused your PTSD under the disability law. Okay. So it, it's like, it may have created those symptoms, but it's like that on top of all the exposures to the big T, t traumas that are part of the right. work. So it, it still has to point back to an accumulation of um, all these big T traumas. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then the reaction then to the discrimination or harassment is more a symptom. Okay. So, and I, and I would say that, you know, when you first start to struggle with something, like if you have a strong reaction after a call, it's important to go mm -hmm. 
to um, talk to a mental health provider, um, even if you don't have PTSD, uh, even if you don't have any diagnosis, it's just a stress reaction because the research supports that early intervention right. um, post-trauma or post-traumatic stress um, will decrease the risk factor for developing PTSD. So one quick question before we have to leave yes. is that do you see more men than women um, that are suffering from these sort of exposures, these sort of traumas, or is it pretty balanced? It does. It's well, I see, I see more men actually, um, as far as coming, like first responders mm -hmm. coming in. Um, I've actually seen more men. Um, the women that I've seen have tended to have, like not be in, they're not a first responder and, and their PTSD is usually um, related to like a sexual or physical trauma. Mm, okay, all right. Yeah. So uh, we're at the end of our Google time. Um, we want to thank, um, not Penwell anymore. It used to be Penwell. Clarion events. Clarion events. Yay. <laughs> Clarion um, Fire and Rescue. Oh, Clarion Fire and Fire Rescue. Rescue. We like to thank them and everybody associated with them. Um, the group uh, who, who's sponsoring this today, uh, certainly Bobby Halton and his crowd uh, for inviting us here today. I'd like to thank Dr. Beth Murphy, um, who yep. will be teaching on uh, Thursday afternoon, 3.30, room 103-104. Be there for your psycholog free psychological evaluations. <laughs> and then um, from my perspective as an attorney, I appreciate uh, people who attended my class uh, this morning. Um, we had a good uh, discussion about the seven different areas, uh, what I call a shallow dive into a deep pool of law, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to hit the surface on the major, seven major issues that really affect the fire service, dealing with people and driving and documentation and you know those sorts of things. So. Until next time, we'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Billy Greenwood, the host of Tap the Box on Fire Engineering Radio, and we're live from FDIC 2019 for the Trusted Voices. We're live from the Indiana Convention Center here at FDIC 2019, and I thank you for joining us today. I got some great friends with me today and some good guests. To my, my left here is uh, Joe Netter. Joe is a presenter and an instructor here at FDIC. He's going to be presenting tomorrow. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Bill. And then Chief Mike Lloyd, a uh, good friend of mine from Nebraska, a uh, recent fire chief, and he's been at the uh, FDIC conferences for many, many years. And uh, and Mike and I also co-teach together, and uh, I welcome you, Mike. Well, thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. So uh, today, uh, Tap the Box, we're live here at FDIC, and uh, I wanted to bring you two guys on to uh, – to discuss a few things. First would be the uh, the FDIC experience. So, Joe, you've been here for a long time. 23 years. It's my 23rd year in a row. Mark. Wow. 23 years consecutive. Yeah. And it's it's different. What I'm finding is um, you know, different facilities, obviously, new convention hall. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. The other thing I'm finding is you get older, you start to realize I'm the dad now. And, <laughs> and everyone around me is so much younger. But... Uh, I still attend. I still attend classes. Um, you can't stop learning. Great no, conference. no, great that's conference. a great mentality and mindset. Is uh, you, you can't stop learning. Yeah. You know, and and Mike, you've been here for quite a while. Yeah, I've had a. I'm having a great conference again every time. Um, walk down the hall and you run into all the people that you've made friends with and meet new people. I met some new people yesterday. It was really great. Um, the class, in fact, Bill just had to call me because I was sitting in class. I was just so enthralled in what was being taught because it was, it was something I was really interested in expanding in my own organization. Yep. So I saw the phone ring and I was like, oh, I got to go. <laughs> I got to go. Gotta yeah, gotta so go. I pulled Mike out of class to be here to, to, uh, to be on Tap the Box here at FDIC 2019. And I apologize for stealing you away from a good class. What were you taking? Uh, it's uh, social media, mastering wow. social media and photography. Ah. Um, it's something my organization struggles with, the social media part. Yep. And when you're trying to recruit um, young career people or as we're a combination department, we're trying to recruit volunteers and we're trying to recruit younger ones. We can't rely on the newspaper so much. Mm. And Facebook is getting to be for old people. Yep. Yes. And, and we have to learn how to adapt and uh integrate all these other things and i don't want to take away from too much from his class but it looks like uh we have to to embrace youtube more and more yes so. yeah uh, the attention span is very short with uh, gen z which is our new recruits uh so social media has figured out and learned that um you know a two and three minute little video yeah. uh is the attention span that people enjoy or it's palatable uh, because they want to move on to the next big thing. Yep. Uh, and if we can hit them hard and fast with short and great content, we get greater engagement. And I would suspect that that's what was going on. And I wasn't in that class, but, uh, you know, the reality is understanding your audience, whether they're millennials, Gen Y or Gen Z. Uh, and that's the group that we need to direct market to. So you made a mention that Facebook now is for old people. Uh, and that's, uh, never been more true <laughs> because kids, um, uh, they don't embrace Facebook like they did in previous generations. Yeah. Gen Y, millennials, Facebook was developed for them. Uh, Gen Z, which is our new kids, 22 years or less, anybody in your organization or workplace, they're Gen Z. So uh, direct marketing to them, Facebook's not going directly to them. Their parents have gotten onto Facebook to see children's yeah. pictures and grandchildren's yep. pictures. Yep. And Gen Z kids are now leaving Facebook because their parents are on it. So they're trying to separate themselves from that. So now they've moved over to the Instagram platform and then Snapchat platform. So um, if you're in a chief's position looking to direct market to your next firefighter or you're a chief that's trying to disseminate information to your current firefighters that are Gen Z, uh, chief's bulletins, emails, uh, and Facebook are the wrong platforms. Even if like Facebook, your department had a closed group Facebook page. I know some organizations have that so that they can disseminate information and the general public can't see it. But some of those Gen Z kids aren't 
really on Facebook anymore because they're trying to separate themselves from that and they're moving on to Instagram. So embracing the platforms and understanding the technology, we need to find key players in our organization that understand social media so that when they post on Facebook, we can cross post on Instagram and then also understand and embrace Snapchat. So, oh, really? yeah, wow. like uh, fire chiefs that aren't embracing multiple platforms are, are disassociated with their workforce and that creates a bigger gap. So I taught today a class called Extreme Leadership Building High Performance Teams. And it doesn't matter what your workplace is or your, or your, um, your mission or your um, causes, regardless if it's fire service, EMS, law enforcement, nursing, healthcare facility, or, or even let's just say a service delivery organization that sells cars. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the people business, you have to embrace these types of mindsets and mentalities so that we can engage and motivate our employees, which then in turn can engage and motivate the people that they serve, regardless of what that service is. So, um, uh, yeah, I've deeply engrossed myself in that because okay. this is the wave of the future. And if we can't gain the, uh, the engagement, we're not going to have anybody joining as a volunteer, not joining as a call firefighter or a paid firefighter. Uh, we have to engage, understand, embrace to motivate good people. So, so Joe, you're teaching tomorrow. Tomorrow, one thirty, room two thirty eight, managing risk in the volunteer fire service. Excellent. Yep. Which also happens to be the uh, title of a book I'm writing for Penwell, due out end of the year. Uh, interesting subject. One that, if you had asked me three years ago, would I be writing a book on? The answer would have been no. Um, <laughs> It just kind of evolved on its own, and I've, I've gotten really deep into this, and I, I just, uh, I can't believe the need, yes. and and I, I can't believe how little so many of us are not using it. it it's, it's unbelievable. Yes, I mean, uh, the fire service, regardless if you're a volunteer paid on call or career, yep. have the same risks, uh, the same liabilities, and some paid organizations even struggle with risk management yep. and it makes it even harder for the volunteer organization that's well trained, well educated and maybe well run to also focus on risk management because yep. they have so many hats that they have to wear in the volunteer service. Right. So one of the hats that they, you know, they choose not to put on is let's focus on training. Let's focus on taking care of Mrs. Smith. Let's focus on apparatus and let's focus on recruitment. And they often forget about retention and they often forget about risk management because they just don't have the same priorities of all those other things that we have to make sure we provide good service delivery. And we also have to have people. So we're starting to see yeah. volunteer organizations that have risk management problems or liability problems with lawsuits, injuries, and death. So your class and the demographic in the United States Fire Service is primarily volunteers. Correct. Yeah, volunteer and on call. And it also will help other small organizations. Uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I use myself a lot as an example because one can always learn from experience. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our experiences were, uh, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> um, what, what I found is the highest risk to us in the volunteer on-call sector, allow me just to say volunteer, is um, on the fire ground, okay? And I, I'm not focusing on community risk and things like that. That's a whole nother subject. I'm starting at the bottom, if you will. I, I went back to the uh, uh, NIOSH reports. And I did some research as I was writing this book, and I got deep into it. And I found out in a 10-year period, uh, ending in 2017, 527 volunteers died in the line of duty. So I says, all right. So from there, I wanted to, how did they, how did they die? Okay, what was the uh, mechanism, if you will, of injury? The number one way, 23% died while responding. They didn't even get to the fire and they were dead and that's sad okay and some of them were in personal vehicles others were in uh, uh, fire apparatus 
Then I said, okay, this is the re this is what they're doing, their activity. What's the number one cause? So I looked at it and 57% heart attack, 57%. So when I heard that, I said, okay, wait a minute. And I immediately blamed it on the old time. It's in my head. And I, you know, we go into the mid Atlantic and places they have fire police, which, you know, you can't do the job anymore physically. So you help out directing traffic and it's a noble endeavor. So, but I, you know, I've heard about guys who are 75 and 80 doing it. So of course, I was prejudiced, and I blamed them. And guess what I found? Of the 57%, 24.5% of the heart attacks were ages 20 to 40. Mm, wow. And that's, that's scary. And that talks to diet. It talks to exercise. It talks to physical fitness. It talks to all of those things that we're not paying any attention to. Yes. And this big push in the fire service <clears throat> about health, and then you get down to our level of the volleys, and they were, you know, it's, it, we haven't bought in entirely. Some have, but many haven't. And I also found out that it was about the same percentage of age 66 and up. Okay, we can accept that, but that that 20 to 40 made me sick. Yeah. It really, really did. That's surprising. That's a surprising age demographic. For yep, that. yep. When you look at that demographic, <clears throat> Some of them may have predisposed conditions. Absolutely. Right. And I know, uh, you know, Chief Mike here has is, is been, uh, you know, fighting for health and wellness mm -hmm. and, uh, and risk reduction uh, for annual physicals. Right. So um, some of those things could pre possibly be prevented if they were found in advance, which would then reduce or limit our risk or liability for one, the event ever occurring, but two, when firefighters go down, what do we do for them, Joe? We what? You know, we do whatever we can. That's right. In the other classes that you teach, in rapid intervention yep. and you know handling yep. a mayday. Yeah. Uh, and oftentimes we see with one and one mayday, we have multiple what? Multiple maydays because firefighters end up, uh, you know, trying to do everything they possibly can for our fellow, fellow brother or sister. So. Um, if you back Believe that bus all the way back up, health and wellness was right. actually the, the primary cause of that event Absolutely. occurring on the fire ground. And I, I just want to, because I've become like reading statistics and all buzzing in my head. You mentioned RIT, and we're not talking about that, but I got to put this in. Don Abbott, everyone, a yep. lot of people know the name, retired and everything. He did a thing called Project Mayday. If you haven't looked at it, it's well worth the read. And in the project, somewhere I'm reading it, I found this statistic. Of all the people who called the Mayday, 76% of those people who called the Mayday had zero confidence in the department's red training. That's a scary subject, too. So back to health and welfare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, I know, you know Mike's been working on and trying to, to uh, implement some of that stuff. And uh, it's complex because you have budgetary issues. Yep. You have um, you have a cultural issue where people are just fearing that at any given moment the plug could be pulled that I can no longer be a firefighter mm -hmm. because I don't pass a physical. Yep. And we cannot expect someone to just turn a light switch on and become twenty years old again when they've been in the fire service for twenty or thirty years. Um, so there's a uh, work-life balance there where we have to understand some people are not going to be perfectly fit at the age of 30, 40, or 50 due to choices in life. And the fire service itself, stress, anxiety, diet, exercise, all those things end up adding up to being a little overweight or having underlying medical conditions. Yeah. So NFPA 1582 has an A and a B, part A for new hires. Typically they're very young, they're supposed to be very fit, and they're not supposed to have a lot of predisposed medical conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you follow that document, uh, you're, you're hoping that with a good health and wellness program that they'll last 20, 30 years without having a medical condition that ends up having uh, a problem on the fire ground. But there's a part B to NFPA 1582 for pre-existing employees 
who may or may not actually have some predisposed medical conditions that you can't expect them to flip a light switch on right. and go back to when they were 20 years old again. So a lot of this comes down to um, budgetary for one, selling it to uh, town administrators, city administrators, the council for the benefits of funding these types of things to reduce risk, but also reduce lost time and injury prevention. And then also on the backside, the medical cost, the medical impact to the city or town insurer of your insurance plan, which essentially they get their rates off of usage on an annual basis. If you have a small community with very little usage, usually your rates don't go up. But if you have a couple of significant injuries or diseases over that time with your pool, next year's rates are, are promoted or produced off of usage and then a prediction of future usage. So uh, if we can have a healthier fire department, we reduce our risk, but we also save in health insurance down the road, That's right. right? And then overtime budgets get impacted uh, where if you have minimum manning or a certain number of people that need to be on duty, uh, those people uh, are getting paid time off because they have sick time, yep. right? And that means we're paying for the position to begin with. And not many fire chiefs in the fire service uh, can predict a budget on how much use we're going to have, whether there's a lost time on duty or a lost time off duty and the usage of sick time. We can predict how many people we have on duty and how many trucks we need to cover and then tell everybody, well, they have sick time. But usually our overtime budgets get into a predicament when we have somebody that's been out for a long-term injury. And then I've got uh, someone out on a shoulder injury for six months and I'm paying for him to be out with a shoulder injury for six months of sick time. But my overtime budget has to take a hit for six months of firefighter coverage at the overtime rate. So then towards the end of the budgetary year, you have to then have that conversation with city and town administrators that... I'm going to be short because I couldn't predict that, you know, firefighter Smith blew his shoulder out uh, and, and we were in this type of predicament. So the health and wellness side of risk management in your class is a, a much bigger uh, topic than one would think on the cover of a book or a class. It, it is. And one of the things that you're talking that's spinning around in my head is it's almost like we have to begin to create a second culture. Okay, we have a great culture in the fire service, you know, we have a lot of pride in it, but with our young people, it's almost we have to begin, it's, not that we're treating them differently, but we got to get them into the mindset of this is, to take care of yourself is important, mm -hmm. and, and to nurture that forward, and let the older guys like me is, we're going to kind of move on. Yep. And, yep. and we, we can't, we can't really treat them all the same, because if they get thrown into the old culture, they might decide that they don't want to take care of themselves. And we have to say that's wrong and find ways to say it, that yeah. it's wrong and ways to tell them why this is a benefit. What, what will this do for you? That's one, what I think. One of the biggest challenges I had found in the past with working through a uh, work labor uh, agreement for health and wellness yeah. was um, the fear of the, or repercussions of if you didn't pass the physical, yep. would you lose your job? because we obviously all need a job. Um, and a lot of uh, unionized departments will fight anything that potentially could have somebody lose their job. And so I can understand that very much. Yeah, we, we, all need, we all need our funding mechanism to take care of our families. So um, the positive uh, organizations that I saw that had successfully negotiated a health and wellness program that was agreed upon by labor and management, those ones had alternative duties. So if you run a combination fire department like uh, Chief Lloyd has, where you're doing uh, fire and EMS, uh, I've seen some organizations where if you didn't pass your NFPA physical for, uh, let's just say respiratory, because you didn't pass the PFT pulmonary function test, that we had an alternate duty uh, um, job description that you would then be assigned to the ambulance and that you wouldn't be allowed to wear an air pack at a fire, but we still could have you operate while you're not burning your sick bank and also not right. being covered on overtime because we just moved your, your, your 
job description around so that you still could maintain while you work through whatever it was. And I'll give you an example. If you do a 1582 physical and you have a head cold or you have a chest cold, some people struggle to get through the PFT uh, because you just can't have the tidal volume while you're sick. So you might actually go there, be a fully functioning NFPA 1582 person, but you have the common wow. cold and you can't pass the PFT. Wow. And you could be sitting at home on your couch watching Oprah yep. or The View, yep. collecting your sick time, and there's someone else at the firehouse that's collecting overtime to cover you because you have a common cold. Now think about this. Out of the other 364 days of that year, how many people have a common cold that in any given moment technically couldn't pass the PFT? right? Because they have chest cold. Uh, so, so alternative duty reduces the risk yep. of budgetary impacts. If you have the capability to negotiate them also reduce the risk of union organizations fearing that they won't um, be able to uh, work and fearing losing their jobs. So uh, another alternative duty would be if you can't, uh, uh, if you couldn't do the lifting, uh, say you couldn't do the minimum lifting capacity because uh, you have a job description that says you have to lift X number of pounds. Well, could you have an alternative duty description for driver only? Yeah. Right. Operator. So yep. there, there is ways around that, that labor and management can come together on the table. Uh, same thing in the volunteer world. Alternative duty for volunteers. Yep. Hey, you're, you're just going to run the truck. You're just going to drive the ambulance. That's what happened to me towards right. the end of it. I right. Just operated. So that all comes down to risk management modeling. Yep. And your class has a strong focus on risk management modeling to reduce risk from a strategy tactics and department eight organizational management. But one of the things that we identified very quickly here was health and wellness. And yes. you could even use your, your model in the health and wellness arena, like the things that we're talking about with alternative duties. Right. So uh, that type of class opens up the doors to cover numerous, numerous topics. Yeah, well, Like in a small organization, when you're paying a lot of overtime, it's a limited pool of people yes. that's going to do the overtime. Yeah. So now you're re increasing their exposure to the sleep deprivation and yes. overwork. And, and you actually kind of creates a domino effect mm -hmm. that you have to manage, too. And that's 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 a, another challenge to it. So and then in, in a wow. small pool. How yeah. long can you run like that before you have burnout? That's exactly right. Right, right before firefighters are like, yeah, I've worked enough overtime. I'm not taking any more. And then you get it down to just a one or two people that are there every day of the week because they're just gluttons for punishment and they're going to take all the overtime that you can give them. But then it creates a risk management concern yep. because of sleep deprivation and total number of hours on duty and punch drunk, even though they haven't had a drop of alcohol, they just haven't had enough sleep you know, from that aspect. So. So yeah, your class uh, has has had great reviews because there's a huge need for it, not only in volunteer worlds, but really in also combination in career departments. Yeah. And uh, you know the FDIC experience uh, when we attract thirty five thousand plus people, um, our demographic is pretty huge in the volunteer arena. Uh, so it is. It is. In, in the in the educational experience track that. Chief Halton and Diane and Virginia manage, uh, they want to make sure that not only are they catering to the career departments, but they also want to make sure in the educational tracks here and also in the book arena and the video arena yep. that they have at the bookstore downstairs, that they make sure that they're keeping all of the demographics happy. And it's I think it's important because one of the things that I, I tell people, and not everyone always agrees, is, you know, we have this thing about we're all firefighters and we're all the same. And I always say, we're not. And they go, but you can't say that. And I say, sure I can. We are the same in our pride of the job. We are the same in our attitudes towards the job. It's a passion for all of us. But we're not all the same when it comes to capabilities. We're not all the same when it comes to training. We're not all the same when it comes to experience. You can't, com you can't compare, say, Joe Netter, in a, in a community that's a combination department with a kid running in Chicago going to five fires in a 24-hour sh uh, shift all the time. It's not the same. His experience is much better. But because of that, we need to step back, look at our organization, and say, where 
in the smaller organizations, the biggest risk we take is on the fire ground. Let's start there, change the attitudes, make people aware of it, and then grow from there into the other aspects. I agree. I agree. You have to prioritize your focus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like you said, the fire ground is the first first place that we do that. So what would be some of the strategies that you would uh, ask them to implement for risk reduction on the fire ground? Like uh, what would we want to make sure that we have a good strong incident command system? But yep, who should we much. assign on those types well, of incidents? Before we get to the fire ground. Oh, yeah. yeah before we get to the fire <laughs> ground, I have a, a new saying, quit driving like demon possessed idiots. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say it all the time now. And, uh, and it's true. Okay. Yep. Um, once we're there, we need to have, a, we need to evaluate things. Number one, we have to have a very strong incident command system. We have to have a very strong accountability system that's used every single time mm -hmm. so that we get used to it and we understand it. Uh, and then we have to go through different things like step one, you know, the, the old, the old fashioned way of saying things, what do I got? Where's it going? What do I got to do to stop it? And we have much more sophisticated ways of asking that today, but it, that still works. And then what I like to add to the fourth is take a look around. What do I got for personnel? What do I got for equipment to meet the needs of the incident? And, you know, if you're in a career department that has four on duty, and you go out, you're going out the door with four. You're not going out the door with 24. And you're going to come down to the same questions and the same big question, do I have the right equipment I need right now? And do I have, what do I have for personnel? Do so you start from there and then you start to build and uh, getting more help, apparatus, thinking about that. You know, one of the things that I'm doing uh, and I'm starting to talk about, and I find it is interesting, Billy, is that when I talk about equipment, I, I one of the questions I now ask, and again, focusing to the volunteers, is what about water? And people look at me and I go, water's equipment. And they go, they still look at me and I go, you can't put the fire out without it. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you got for water? What do you need? <laughs> so we're, we're driving it from there. Then we're gonna we're getting into identifying the risk, identifying the dangers, how do they affect us? We then go from there and we're, we're gonna learn to uh, um, determine what we need to do to, con to control those identified risks, limit firefighter danger, realize that every time you put a person in, in into the building, if you will, okay, or involved in the firefight, you are putting them at risk. We have to accept that. Uh, if we're if it's a, a, a surround and drowned, and I'm operating a Chicago loop, am I in the collapse zone? If I am, you've put me in danger. So it, it's starting to think, not just grab that pre-connected inch and three quarter every time and run. It's it's teaching us stop to think and to think safely. I'd say in my classes, when I teach strategy and tactic classes, uh, you know, it's one thing to be aggressive because your organization is known to be an aggressive department. Right. But because of today's new hazards, lightweight construction, yeah. all of the things that have changed in the world, it's now time for our firefighters to be educated aggressive, where they can make good risk management yes. modeling before they commit uh, to an interior exterior attack and all the things that you just mentioned. So uh, I like to say, you know, ad, uh, aggressive firefighting is what the United States Fire Service was essentially right. uh, built upon. I'm not trying to take away from that and say that we need to abandon it, but we need to make sure that we educate our personnel to how to be educated, aggressive firefighters so Correct. that they can make good decision making, yeah. you know, they, on the fire ground. They, they got to look. You got, you know, I mean, the people that were trained by my generation, and I'm 66 years old, so you can kind of do the math. People were trained by my generation. Flow path, what's flow path? Vent limited, what's vent limited? You know, we would grab the, grab the line and go. Every time. Every time. Every single time. Now it's different. And, yeah. and, and we think about the stuff in the building and what's burning and, you know, the tightness of the building, energy efficiency. It's so different. So much more it, complex. Yes, it is. Than what it was. It's still the basic fundamentals of what we do on a day-to-day right. -day basis, but at much more complexities than ever before yes. uh, because of uh, modernization. Absolutely. What are some of the challenges, Mike, that you have in, you know, Nebraska 
a risk management in you know a smaller combination department well probably not much unlike what joe's been through with a combination department is how many people do i have how long is it going to take for them all to get there yeah. Are they going to get cut off by a train before they get there? <laughs> yes, <laughs> this one had <hadn't> access. <laughs> Act, you know, Your access. train's along. <laughs> yeah, so we well, we had a we had a barn fire that um, our first engine got there. Three on the engine uh, pulled a line, and they were making actually holding this fire, and then the the train came by and blocked the tanker, uh -huh. so they couldn't get tanker. access. So we had a thousand gallons of water on that engine. They ran out of water. And by the time they got there, the fire just kind of it. Re, you know, they always talk about resetting the fire. Well, the fire took a took a break for a second and then blew out. I, I think Bill, you saw the pictures that yeah. we that we that were posted, and it it was a violent violent incident. But um, but those are the kind of things when when you're you're calling your mutual aid, and I, my depending on what part of my district, it could be 15 minutes before the first mutual aid arrives yeah and that's that'd be a fast response and it's yeah. nothing against them it's just the yeah, just demographics the, and ge geography, geography you know and access and, and then temperatures and, i was going to ask you about winter is winter tough in nebraska it yeah we had a fire um just a few weeks ago that was uh 10 below and huh. um wow yeah it was, well you say winter in nebraska but here it's april 9th 2019 at fdic international and Mike, what's going on in Nebraska right now? Oh, my wife sent me a picture yesterday of uh, the lawnmower and the snowblower on the driveway. And she said, this is springtime in Nebraska. Both of these are going to get used this week. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening today? There's what going on? Uh, well, nothing today. No, quiet. No, it's going to hit tomorrow night. Oh, it hasn't got to you yet. No. What are you There's parts in? of Nebraska right now that have an 18 to 24-inch storm, right? No, that's the prediction. It's oh. all going to start hitting. Uh, tomorrow night you're kidding no yeah all these guys are concerned about getting home from oh here they're driving into a two-foot blizzard in april in a in a state that doesn't get two-foot blizzards on a regular My basis God. you know us we're like hey we're going to the mountain yeah you know yeah, yeah, get yeah. the skis in the car kids yeah. we're going to the mountain but out there it shuts down right it just well, we you know where i'm at we have interstate 80 and then we have a north south highway highway 81 and we'll get we can only get three or four inches of snow, but with 40 and 50 mile an hour winds, it creates blizzard like conditions. Yeah, yeah. And the interstate ice is over. And if they don't shut the interstate down, and State Patrol does not shut down the interstate, it's the Department of Transportation. And Department of Transportation focuses on commerce. Yeah, keep not moving. On, yeah, keep them all moving. And it, the other side is if they shut down the interstate, they'll go to a secondary highway and we'll create bigger problems, you know, and they're putting them right through the communities and so it, it's just those challenges and you're showing up with you know a small group and you just keep praying that more are coming and and uh, that's probably our biggest challenge is just the time it takes and i came from a department where when uh, we we went out on a, just even an automatic alarm we had 12 14 people wow. and now I, we roll out the door with three or four people and it's a delay because of these people are coming from their jobs or from their homes yeah. and in, day, in daytime before five six o'clock in the afternoon um, you just don't know what you're going to get you know? yeah and, no. and, and that's around the clock now today because people work second oh, and third shifts yeah. and the dad might work in the day and the mom might be a nurse at night or something yeah so yeah. We go home with a little yeah I, I, it, it's so much different than it was i was just out to ago. nebraska not long ago uh for the les luca conference and uh and they had some snow when we were there and but just before that you had another storm a bad storm and literally joe because there's no there's no mountains it's just it's flat. the plains right yeah. so like when the wind blows the snow is just sideways mm -hmm. and when we in northern new england are like well three four inches you know we're still going to school school's not canceled it's a dusting it's a dusting, but out there, literally snow's blowing sideways. And they, you guys had a really horrific multi-vehicle accident on the highway yeah, that responders 23rd. got hit, you know, yeah. February. February 23rd. How big an incident was it? It was uh, 22 vehicles. Oh my God. And um, it was it was weekend, I was at home. So we I hear the call, I get my 
insulated clothes on, go run out to my pickup and respond to the interstate. And I thought my ambulance was ahead of me, but they actually ended up being behind me. And I'm doing 40 miles an hour on the interstate and I can't see a quarter mile because it's that blowing that hard. And I get to the incident and I'm at, I'm at the west end of the incident. And we thought that's where the injuries were. Actually, at that end, I didn't have any injuries. The ambulance had to go through the median to get to the other end. And we had several down there. And then we called for mutual aid I guess, yeah. with uh, a volunteer fire department. And their, one of their vehicles got hit by um, a okay. jackknifing semi. And they had four people inside that, that vehicle. And uh, two of them were really, four of them were really hurt. The two of them are, were severely hurt. One of them um, is, uh, um, she's doing much better, but she's, she's got a long road to recovery. And, and it's things like that, that, you know, when you talk about traffic incident management, Tim's training, all the Tim's training in the world doesn't stop that, you know. I know that. But it, it, we, you do everything you can to try to of protect. Course. Of course. But that is. If I ever take another chief's job, if there's an interstate within the district, <laughs> <laughs> declined. <laughs> nope. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have no control from a risk management model of these semi trucks that are just hauling, yeah. Yeah. and they got to get from point A to point B because they got to get paid, and they're not going to lay up during a storm. They're just going to drive through it, and then you have a small accident that you can't see very far ahead of you, and then you just have. You know, cars piling into each other, tractor trailers plowing into, and and Mike was unfortunate to be involved with organizations in the in his community and nearby community where those trucks came in and you know plowed into emergency responders. Well, and then twenty miles to the west of us, Aurora Fire Department they they had a tanker as a block block vehicle, and that tanker got hit. Wow. And, so now and for the West Coast guys, that's a tender, not a tanker. So. <laughs> yeah, that's just what you say. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a tanker has wings, right? Yeah, tanker, yeah. tanker, yeah, tanker, 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 Yeah, but, <laughs> but so, so those, those, are, those are all part of it. And that department is all volunteer, you know, and, and it's just. It, it's, it's tough. I, 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 and this young lady, you said she is doing better. She is doing better. We um, Saturday, the day before I we left, the, their department had a huge um, uh, fundraiser to to help offset costs because they have two pieces of damaged equipment. One of them is totaled, um, and then the uh, medical bills. I'm sure. I'm I'm sure that there'll be some some lawyers involved and and all yeah. that in the, yeah. To, to help with that, but but it doesn't help on the short end. No, you know, no. You know, you can't go to work. You can't, uh, you know, you can't earn your regular paycheck on a Thursday to take care of your family. That's right. Uh, you know, right. and if it's uh, let's just say it's a workman's comp related case, not many people I know can live off of sixty percent of what they already make. They need to make a hundred percent of That's what right. they make so they can continue to right. to maintain. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, risk management modeling. If you could prevent some of these things, and we can't prevent everything. No, we can't. But if we can prevent some of those things, it lessens that impact to the hardship, the financial hardship, the uh, emotional stress, the post-traumatic stress, uh, not only of the employee, but also the family, like their mm -hmm. family, and then the organization. Yeah. Like, yes. you know, God forbid that something happened to this, this woman that was an emergency responder on a small organization what is the mental anguish and impact yep. to that organization where some of those members would be like, you know what, I'm done volunteering because I didn't sign up to die on the highway during a four or five inch snowstorm with 40 and 50 mile an hour winds. I, I actually talk about this uh, uh, tomorrow in a firsthand experience and it's, it is part of the book. And I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to get the message to uh, out to the volunteers is that um, what's at risk is your family. Okay, and is you know the, the, the two exposures are death and injury, and you know death. Uh, there is a um, emergency responder federal benefit. It's not a lot. It was like three hundred something thousand. It's not a lot of money if you got two three kids at home, uh, and uh, a lot of the states don't have anything for the volley. And then uh, um, the hardship that's going to befall your family. But then you get the other side. You allude, alluded to it with this young lady. Injury. 
I think injury is worse than death, okay, because the lost income, yeah. okay? You, you, if you get injured on the fire department as a volley, your career, whatever you're doing for a real job, they're not going to pay out, okay, you know, because you're, that was yeah, over there. they're more than likely going to replace you because they yeah. need an able-bodied person to do whatever it is that's that right. you did because it, that's their business. And what makes it, I think, worse for injury is in a long-term injury, you're still sitting there seeing your family suffer. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can't fix it. And you can't. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's I, I, we're later when we're off the air, I want to get some information on uh, this young lady and maybe, you know, using old time Facebook or and get stuff. her story, get her yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. And see or even some of the other members, if maybe she doesn't want to speak about it because it's so acute and she doesn't really want to share yet because she probably hasn't fully, uh, you know, learned everything that she needs to know or, or, you know, lived through the experience yet. Uh, maybe some of the other people that were there because it was four people that were yep. actually hurt, you know, because it's going to take time to heal, not only physically, but emotionally and, and mentally. And, Absolutely. and I think you're right when, when you're hurt and laid up and you can't do what you love, regardless of what it is, then, um, you beat yourself up yes. and you have no control of what happened to you, but you just beat yourself up because you're not whole, you're not a hundred percent. So and there's a whole know. other PTSD type mm -hmm. scenario right there. And I honestly believe that people who write books, who do videos or teach classes, firsthand accounts of real life experiences, uh, solidify the content because, you know, you can preach and, and talk about your content, but if you don't have firsthand experiences right. or anything like that, then after a while, your audience gets bored because it's just facts. But when you uh, humanize it yep. so that you can make it even better and more impactful uh, or have more purpose, I think that uh, it takes it to the next level, right? So there's great instructors and then there's, you know, extremely or exceptional instructors that understand how to engage and motivate through humanizing things with passion. You will see that tomorrow. <laughs> well, it's like when we went after your class today, I, I just stopped in his class at, after his, at the end of his class because I wanted to visit with him and, and uh, people were talking and, and just standing there listening to him talk about their experiences. And then when, when we started sharing some of our experiences using his, some of his tools, it really kind of adds to that connection of how it matters and how it plays into things. I, at least that's my feeling on it. His, his programs are phenomenal. Oh. They really are. And uh, I've, I've actually uh, just recently recommended him to a small volunteer organization up in Massachusetts, and hopefully they'll find a way to get him there. But uh, you can take what he teaches and what, what he – Beyond that, what he shares, right? Okay, and you can apply it in, in, in private industry for God's sake, it, across the board. It, it it applies at home, it applies at work, it applies in your whatever group you're involved in. Understanding right. all the other people and personalities yeah. and their their strengths and weaknesses and tendencies makes a huge difference. I guess my focus. Uh, uh, and my purpose for that class was to elevate people who were thrusted into positions in the people business. And the business side of that doesn't matter if it's your personal or professional life. It could be with your husband, wife, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, it could be with your children. Uh, it could be in the workplace with two employees or it could be in the workplace with 2000 employees, whether you're a CEO or you're, a guy, uh, you know, labor in the trenches, digging, uh, on the side of the road and you have to motivate and enhance people's lives. So we typically understand at our generation with a work ethic that you get strokes from taking care of people, uh, by giving good service and, and our demographics have changed because of the, cultural gap that's involved with Gen Y and Gen Z. Uh, so we're all products of the environment we were raised in and we were raised differently than they were raised. And mm -hmm. now we're forced to supervise or lead or manage these people, depending upon whatever industry you're in and maybe not understand what drives and motivates them because they were raised differently. So uh, I teach how to bridge the gap 
uh, I spend more time and focus on the management team or the leadership team to understand their target audience, their personnel, so that they can then change the way they communicate, the way that they engage and motivate people. And, and ultimately, it fixes a few things, it fixes recruitment, it fixes retention, it, it fixes workplace happiness or employment satisfaction, yep. uh, which ultimately then has a direct effect with customer service uh, or productivity or taking care of Mrs. Smith uh, in the street. And if you're struggling or suffering with people leaving very early, young in their career to go to another organization or get out of this industry altogether, they don't necessarily dislike the service. They love the service. That's why they're in the service. They don't like how they're being treated by their direct supervisor or potentially senior management or the command team. So uh, the focus has been on understanding the generational indifferences of uh, cultural diffusion. Each and every one of us have a, have a certain way that we are raised and each and every one of us have a way that we want to be treated, talked to, and, and engaged and motivated. And if we don't understand our audience, sometimes the way we treat them is not motivating. It's seen as toxic and people move forth or end up just being disgruntled and continue to come to work on their day to day because they need a paycheck. And that's really uh, unfortunate because we all need a paycheck, but no one enjoys coming to work into an environment that's not fun. It's not happy. It's not satisfying, uh, which it could be if we just retooled the, uh, the command staff, the leadership organization or the management team, depending upon what demographic you're in. So I like to teach a class that when you leave, you have a big leadership toolbox, a bunch of tools that you can implement so that you can get people uh, happy, motivated, and we have job satisfaction. Uh, it solves your problems with recruitment and retention. You have people that last a long time and ultimately leave the organization better than you found it. Because yeah. really what's happening right now, there's a bunch of people in the fire service that have been carrying on the torch with tradition. And they're quickly realizing what worked for them in the past is no longer working for them with recruitment, no longer working with them with retention. And people are leaving or people won't join or won't volunteer. They won't come back on big calls to cover the station. They won't come back on big calls to take trucks to multi-alarm fires. And we have less and less and less and we're expected to do more and more. And there's some barriers there, financial commitment, work life and all these things. But there's a big section that organizations have dropped the ball with engaging and motivating people if they retooled their leadership team so that they have a better understanding of the resources they have so that we can have positive responses, full trucks, people coming back and willing to, to, to give up some work-life balance with time away from their wife, spouse, or, or children and come back on that big call versus I'm just going to clear the pager and never heard that call and I'm going to do what I do because I'm more happy with my own family and, and my friends. So um, if we don't retool them, eventually you will leave the fire service because you can't fix the problem yep. and you'll leave disgruntled and you had a great career. Two thirds of your career was happy and the last third you leave the fire service dissatisfied with your performance because you just didn't understand the human dynamics of the people business. So this morning I taught that class, Extreme Leadership, Developing High Performance Teams, and it was based off of the three pillars of human excellence, which is intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence, what I need to know during times of stress, chaos, and crisis, and can I recall some of that intellectual intelligence during chaos and crisis? And then the third aspect of the third pillar is interpersonal dynamics, understanding that Michael and understanding that Joe are completely different people, have a completely different DNA and an upbring, upbringing and a completely different roadmap to wherever they landed themselves in successful businesses or successful ranks. And then understanding how I plug into the different personalities and how those personalities actually affect emotional intelligence, and intellectual intelligence. It's a puzzle. And if we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle, we never have a happy, we never receive gratification to complete a thousand piece puzzle because someone lost 15 or 20 pieces and we don't have a full puzzle. Right? Well, emotional intelligence is such a huge thing in business now that they're in business schools, they're actually 
requiring courses on emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. I leave you with this. Uh, most everybody likes sports, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we being from New England, we're New England Patriots fans. Yep. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. So uh, if you look at the New England Patriots, they've got Tom Brady. Yes. Okay. And they've got Rob Gronkowski, who just retired. retired. Okay. But I'm going to bet you after he does the, the wrestling thing, I bet you he comes back second half of the year. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. So here's the thing. Uh, when we have a lot of injuries on that roster, we don't have any. Uh, ex we don't have any elite players. Correct. We don't have any uh, elite wide receivers. We don't have any of those players. So Belichick has the ability yes. to look at every other NFL team in the in the uh, industry and hire for pennies on the dollar some practice squad guy because That's he right. saw one phase, one discipline that he could exacerbate that person and make a play that would gain the greatest productivity out of them. So if you look at the Patriots, for example, uh, they make more player changes than anyone else yep. in the NFL. Uh, they put the best players on the offense for the highest percentage of getting the first down or scoring a touchdown. So they change out more players on offense. Rob Gronkowski doesn't play the whole game. He only plays when they need to put a block in to give it to a short little dump pass to get a first down. The guy who's catching the ball is some practice squad player that they paid the minimum yeah, standard of $100,000 a yeah. year to play in the NFL, right? And then that player's out because the next play is not in his strong wheelhouse. On the defensive side, they do the same thing. First down, second down, third down, somebody's already studied all the books. Someone studied all the video, and they have a percentage of what the play is that they're going to call. And if the other team has the same players on the ball – all downs and they never make changes it's easier for you to read and map the team on what's their next call for third and long or third and short and the Patriots put more people on the field to stop the highest percentage play that's predictable we make more changes when other teams try to do that Tom Brady counts people on the field and when they get one lazy guy that gets off the field slow he calls a quick snap and they get a, they get a first down for too many men on the field everyone complains that we're cheating okay now Long story short, everybody wants to hire the Patriots players. Wes Welker, he was an incredible wide receiver, right? Uh, you look at Danny Amendola, another yeah. really good player, right? Yeah. They both went to other teams. People paid lots of money for them, and they produced nothing, zero. They're losers on other teams. The only time that they looked exceptionally well was when Bill Belichick developed a play that put them in the spotlight, and after that play was over, they were on the bench, and then they went back out for that high percentage play. Everybody wants the New England Patriots coaches. We've got a guy coaching in Chicago. We got another guy that just went to another location, right? And they're not going to be able to produce unless they change the way that organization runs, right? This you can't go to a new organization and run their system and expect different results. You think about that for a second. And the I fire know, service, absolutely. right? It's all about systems and absolutely. components. Right? There's departments that are extremely functional, but then there's departments where when you make one change or change a fire chief, the department has now gone from dysfunctional to functional because that fire chief has a new vision. Focus on people's strengths. Don't focus on their weaknesses. That's what the Patriots do. Literally, they focus on people's strengths, and when your percentage time is not there, you're not on the field. Right? Well, all I can say is you just gave away all our secrets to it's the over. Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> uh, and I'll be honest with you. I'm not a Tom Brady fan. Like I, I'm a fan. But I'm I'm not like no, religious. No, 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 now look at like. if any other team bought him, he would not produce what he produces. He'd be horrible on any other team. He so can't run. He's making notes. He's going to be sending them to the Jets. He can't <laughs> run. He can't run. He can't throw. Right. But they design plays around Tom Brady's strengths. Absolutely. And if he went to another team and someone paid him more than what the Patriots would play, he would be the biggest loser in the NFL. Probably. And it's not because. He's a great player. It's because Bill, Bill Belichick's the mastermind of that. When he's gone, the dynasty's over, and we'll go back to being losers in Schaefer Stadium, and I lived through all that. We're getting the hook. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with that said, systems and components, right, risk management, all the things that we've talked about for this last hour uh, is important. And the fire service could le learn a lot from parallels uh, with sports industry and also um, with other organizations that have great risk management modeling. Tomorrow, Joe's got a great class. Hopefully people can be there.
Please attend. What was it again? 130. I think it's 238. Yep. Managing risk in the volunteer fire service. Excellent. Chief yeah. Mike Lloyd, thank you for coming and sharing this morning. Appreciate, appreciate yeah. you having me. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Billy Greenwood, tap the box. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. You've got two strong gentlemen that are going to make Billy Greenwood look silly. Chief Sulka, Chief Lasky, coming up next, FDIC 2019. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Hey, welcome to the command post. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good buddy and partner, Chief John Salka. And uh, again, here we are. We're at FDIC 2019. Let's do hashtag FDIC 2019. Uh, another great conference. It's already filling up. The, we were talking about apparatus a little while ago and everything else. I'm um, seeing some great people, some some great friends. And uh, uh, our, field, our, our field chief officers program for the battalion chiefs, Fill up the room, right? Well, good good audience. A lot of contributions, a lot of back and forth, which was always makes the class better. Yep. Filled up the room. So and 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 for, for a lot of our viewers, a lot of our listeners, um, uh, what you're gonna see coming and posting real soon. We've done our battalion chief schools, our battalion chief academies for, for years now. And just like we did the Cubby Officer Academy, 
we retooled it a little bit into a two-day program now, two-day academy for field chiefs, for battalion chiefs, district chiefs, those that respond in the field. Um, and it's going to be great. First day is going to be all different topics. Second day is going to be all incident scenarios, multiple arms, and all those different things like that. So right. look forward right. to that. Then we got the big room with, with, with Bobby Halton Thursday, issues Thursday. and challenges, always and Friday fun. morning. If you're around, try and make that always yeah. a good opportunity for you to ask the question that you've been talking about on the kitchen table at the firehouse, and suddenly you got a couple of guys up there maybe that have a uh, point of view that you haven't heard. Exa and then, ex exactly, we usually – we get a little uh, outspoken about some things. A little animated now and then. <laughs> That's right. Animation and then, without vulgarity, absolutely. <laughs> and then Friday morning, we have the three degrees of May Day again. So um, another Excellent. great one. Get there early because it fills up fast. Before we go too much further, um, I don't know if it actually happened yesterday, but uh, an FDNY firefighter, firefighter Chris uh, Schlutman from uh, Ladder 27 in the Bronx, quartered with 46 engine, a great company. Um, Good firefighter, also a United States Marine, uh, was killed with several several other Marines in Afghanistan. Uh, I believe it was yesterday, or maybe a little bit earlier. By the time the the news from the military gets uh, gets back here, but uh, great great guy, young man, family man, um, member of uh, the FDMY, obviously the United States Marine Corps, Kentland Volunteers down in Maryland. Uh, really lived and loved the fire service and. Uh, our hearts uh, go out to his family. And you're talking about someone that not only dedicated their life to serving the citizens of New York City, but to, to the world, to our country, right. being a veteran. Um, John, there's a lot of people. You've got you have two sons, you know, Brian, a Marine, and now with uh, North Charleston FD in South Carolina. James is a captain in the Marines. Um, my son was six years as an FMF corpsman. You know, we we know what it's like to be home when our when our kids are overseas. Yep. Um, it takes a special person to dedicate their life to that as serving our country. What is it like? One percent actually serve as in, in in the five branches, one way, shape, or form out of everybody. So, for a lot of folks out there that tend to forget, uh, you know, that everything we are allowed to enjoy, uh, everything that we're allowed to do is, is is usually a direct result of our veterans and those that keep us. Uh, Safe. So God bless. And the cost. Oh. You know, we, we don't talk about it all the time because everybody doesn't really bear the cost. The military bears the cost and the military families. Those are the folks that pay the price for the freedom of everyone else. So, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance and the national anthem and respect for the country and the flag and things like that, that's one of the that's one of the issues there that makes it so controversial is that uh, there's a very small group of people that really risk everything. Uh for the rest of us to, to live the way that we do. So it should be appreciated and at least remembered. Well, and you mentioned, you know, being away for their families, you know, those of us in the fire service that work shifts, you know, we talk about, oh, it's going to be so tough. I'm going to be working Christmas this year. I'm going to be working, try going away for eight months or 10 months on a deployment, right. Um, right. Uh, 12 months in some cases. Uh, uh, and again, a lot of them get deployment pay, but that doesn't add up to the time away from your family. And, and, and they don't make a whole lot to begin with in the service. I mean, that's just, yeah. that's it. It takes a special kind of person. You know what, John and I and all of our shows, we'll end it today. We end up a lot of shows, so we'll get it out of the way right now. Uh, I do the same thing at Hump Day Hangouts is, you know, we always end it with, you know, please keep the men and women armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. So please do. And this is, this is another hero. Uh, a lot of people throw that word around like loose change sometimes. Uh, uh, you know, they, they do something – Kind of insignificant, even sometimes, and everybody's calling him a hero. And you've got uh, got a guy that 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 lost his life uh, overseas, and um, God bless him. God bless him and his family. So I'm glad you mentioned that. You know yeah, what? Yeah. A lot of people forget that uh, our good friend Bill Carey that manages Fire Firefighter Nation. Uh, I know he was texting me, you know, asking, you know, um, yeah. and he asked, he goes, he goes, you think guys gonna mention? I said, oh, John's already got in his notes. So Bill, thank you uh, for following up on that too. Bill's always. Absolutely. You like him. Bill, Bill's the data, not drama guy. Yep. You know, for those of you that are watching this, if you want, the, if you want the real stuff, if you don't want all the drama and all the nonsense and all the Facebook firefighter crap and all the rest of this, you know what? You, you need to be following Firefighter Nation at Fire Nation. You know, on Twitter, Firefighter Nation, because Bill puts out. He puts out the data. He put, right. It's hard to argue with facts, right? It's facts, not fluff. Like you said, it's so true. And he and he and he researches it and finds it and discovers it and publishes it and talks about it. 
So at least everybody <laughs> else has access to the same information. You're not going to win that argument, okay? No. It's hard to argue with the facts when they've got the statistics right in front of them. So if you're not following Firefighter Nation, you need to be following Firefighter Nation. And you can follow Bill, too. He's on he's on Twitter as well. So, hey, um, I want to ask you a question, all right? 33 years in New York City, some of the busiest companies, all right? Um, we've talked about that before. Uh, all those years, all those years as a battalion chief in the Bronx as well, only, you know, only one, not in the 18th Battalion, and finish up years as the battalion commander. But you've also been a volunteer firefighter pretty much your whole career, 40-plus years. Yep. And for a lot of years with the South Blooming Grove uh, Volunteer Fire Department in New York. Yes. Uh, there's other, I know there's other South Blooming Groves, but this is the one I'm talking about. Right, right, right. Um, and now um, last Thursday, I think it was last your – Last Thursday was the election, yep. And your first – you're back as chief now. Correct. As, as lots of volunteer fire departments do, uh, our uh, officer corps is selected by election. Not my favorite, not my favorite, uh, you know, method of selecting officers, but it's certainly, I would probably say it's, it's probably the majority of volunteer fire departments around the country select their officers uh, via election. Anyway, short of that, we, we attached a few years ago, actually many years ago, um, we attached requirements and classes and, and other accomplishments to the different ranks. So you don't just merely throw your hat in and you know, go out and buy coffee or beer for everybody and get a bunch of votes. You really do have to perform and you have to be up to a standard. Um, so I uh, I jumped back in as a chief, uh, actually. Well, you were first assistant ago. for how long? Well, you know what? Prior to this, you it's, had to It's actually the confusing because uh, I was chief back in 96, 97, 98. And um, that's just about almost 20 years ago. And since then, <clears throat> we changed it. We had term limits for two years for chief. For chief only, but for two years. But since it was for chief... First assistant and the second assistant ended up with two two year limits as well. Because once the chief stayed for two, then everybody moved up. So my first uh, chief's rank this time around, second assistant. I was second assistant for two years because the guy that was chief that year was just chief for two. And then I made first assistant, and I was there for um, three, and which I just finished because we changed the bylaw to a three year um, term limit. And now I'm going to be chief for three years. Uh, if I win three elections, I'll be chief for three years. Uh, so it'll be a total of three, six, eight years. And the fellow following me right now will be nine years. He'll do second assistant as he just finished for three. He'll do first assistant three. He'll do chief three, which is nine. Now, we, we have friends like uh, Tom Merrill, who is actually teaching right now, I think. From Snyder? Uh, yep, from Snyder, New York, up, up near the Buffalo uh, area. And his volunteer fire department does five years, five years, five years. Five years second assistant, five years first year, first assistant, and five years for chief. Well, let me, let That's me ask dramatic. You. That's let a 15-year commitment. Because you and I have talked about this before, that, and, and to a lot of our volunteer friends out there, which we love you, how difficult it is, you know, okay, you, you, you get to be chief, and you've got a plan, and you want to do this, you want to do this, but in some cases you're only in there for a year. It's how do you, John, and that's what I'm saying, the difficulty <laughs> in seeing through your, your plan, your strategy, what you want to do for the department if you're constantly changing people. So I don't know if the five years is that. That sounds like actually if you can make it work the right – now, you could be stuck with the wrong person too, but at the same time, to be able to have time to really see things roll. I think three or four it would probably be the best. Five might be a little bit, but I don't think it's bad. Uh, we had two, and I thought two was terrible for a couple of reasons. Number one, you got in, and it was your first year, and then it was your last year. There wasn't even a middle year. Um hard to get stuff done in any organization in, in, in 24 months from the night you get sworn in till the day they throw a party and, and you're out. Um, it's 24 months. It's just not a lot of time. You're talking about two summer times in between, two holiday seasons that, you know, things slow down for. So that was one of the reasons I, and I was the driving force behind it, uh, behind changing the two-year to a three-year term limit. Um, and I finally got it done. I tried several times. However, I was always out traveling or, or a vacation or out on a seminar somewhere out of state, and I, and I rarely made those meetings, and it went down. This year, for the first time in a couple of years, I was at the annual meeting, and uh, <laughs> I was able to exert a little more influence on some of the folks there that needed some direction, and, uh, and we got a pass. So uh, actually not this year. It was last year. The, the, the chief that just went out, Scott Morris, uh, did a great job, and he was the first chief to serve three years in a long time. So he just went out. I just went in. We got a lot of stuff, a lot of plans ahead of us. Scott did a great job left a great legacy, and uh, I have some ideas that, that might be different than what we did in the last couple of years, but that's, that's one of the pluses of having a rotating chief's position is you don't get in, you don't have doldrums. You don't just have one thing happening all the time, dragging on for maybe five or six years. And you mentioned Snyder uh, with Tom. That's you, you and I have no problem, and we do it all the time in class. We talk about if you're looking for the model volunteer fire department, 
still the back by 80 percent you know we talk about Amboy, Illinois, Jeff Bryant, Chief Jeff Bryant. Oh, my God. First of all, the training they put on there every April, but throughout the year, and Phenomenal. the department, the people. And then you got Snyder, where Tom Merrill's at. And Tom, Tom, Tom does the program, the professional volunteer. Oh. There you go. There's another radio show, and there's another there's another uh, article series you should be following, the professional volunteer fire department. And he does a great job with that. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it, can't be a career, a career everywhere. They're always volunteers are always going to be the backbone of the fire service. That's just how it works. And we've done both. But the challenges, I know the challenges. We hit us in class. I, I know I've dealt with in my career and you have. You know, everybody wants to blame generation. You know how I feel about that, John. They want to blame generation this and, and millennials for this. I'm like, you know what? Every time I hear somebody blame a millennial, I think it's somebody who's in their 60s that's doing stupid stuff. Okay. And I could point to them as fast as every generation has had their challenges. I tell you this story about my dad. My dad's in his late 80s, a Marine in Korea. And I asked him, he was a firefighter, what was it like recruiting people back in the 60s? And I didn't get 60s out of my mouth. He said, you mean them damn hippies? <laughs> and I'm like, hippies? And he went through this whole time. And, about, and I'm like, so I guess they had challenges too. So you've got young guys and gals coming on. And we've talked a little bit about this before in some of the classes, the whole recruitment and retention thing. You know, now it's not the old days. Where, where, where Billy's hardware store, Billy didn't care if you ran out the door and cost him money. And now there's commitments. And there, and now everybody's got a soccer team somewhere. And there's and there's recitals. And there's there's other things going on. And you, you're still trying to do drill nights and meeting nights. How, I just do, don't know what it is. I just don't know what it is. And and, and uh, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult to attract new people in into the volunteer fire service in 2019. Um, it has been for, for a couple of years now. Our, our membership is, uh, I don't want to say dwindling, but it's definitely on a downturn right now. Uh, we have enough to, to keep going. We operate uh, sufficiently. We don't operate tremendously. Uh, some mornings we just get two, two people come out for a call of an MVA or something like that. The point is there's, there's something going on. I'm not quite sure what's going on. It's uh, generational. It's financial. It's cultural. I think there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of input from a lot of different angles. My fire department has, in the last maybe five years, a gigantic influx of young men. Well, let me let me inter boys. let me interrupt for a second because, you know, you're in New York State, okay? You're in Orange County, a lot of FDNY folks, both EMS and fire, you know, around there. I think one of the advantages you have in that region is you have a pool of a lot of folks that are already doing it as a career person that. You, you know, you have a lot of guys that because I've, I've asked you. So, oh, that guy, that guy's on uh, whatever such an engine company, and that guy's in the Bronx. That guy's in the Manhattan. And and I think when we get away from there, you know, when you get away from a metro area like Chicago or whatever, and you get out into the more rural areas where you're not around, like the city of New York, the challenge is even more difficult because now you don't even have a lot of career guys yeah, to but, kind of borrow, right? But or on no? the other hand, I think when you get away from the metro areas and the urban areas. Then you get more into the country and you get into that small town atmosphere. That's true. Where people feel a little bit more, um, you know, able to participate and give back to their community. That's and, true. And the pace is a little bit slower. So I, I think there's advantages, obviously, to both. You know, living in, right outside the city in Yonkers or Orange County, we're not quite right out of the city, but we're not terribly, terribly far. Uh, NYPD guys, we have we have several police officers in our in our volunteer fire department. Well, and you're right, because I, I saw that. The one guy put that thing up. Want to make it? It says, "Want to make a difference? Volunteer at your local fire department." And he listed about ten things. This is what you get out of it, right? You, you know, the challenges, helping your neighbors. See, you never used to have to do that. When I uh, became a volunteer firefighter in 1976, probably a list. You, you, oh, there was a list. It was absolutely a waiting list to get into every company. Mineola, Mineola Fire Department, great place. Volunteers out of Long Island. They had 150 members, three companies: Engine One, Ladder Two, Engine Three. Each company had a 50-person roster with a limit, with a cap. And it was full, and they were always full, and it was always a waiting list. I, I, I joined. I was uh, interested anyway, started showing up, hanging around a firehouse. Eventually, I found a uh, – uh, you had to have a host. You had to have somebody in a firehouse come out and sponsor you. And I, I had Billy Bowen. Billy Bowen is a uh, great guy. Billy Bowen was an Nassau County police officer, lived pretty close to me. Um, he, he sponsored me into the company when, when the time came to, uh, to fill an opening. And, uh, and that was also done pretty much in order of, of, of application. You know, nobody's buddy got ahead of him or anything like that. Not that that never happened. But uh, And actually getting in or out of the company was a, was a black ball and a, and a white ball. <laughs> so if there were 20 guys in the room 
everybody got a black ball and a white ball, marble. And then they passed this box around with a hole. And you got to vote with a white ball or a black ball. White ball was no That thank goes you. back to like the dark ages, You're the not black kidding. ball. And the black like... ball was no thank you. And, and it went all around. I think, I don't think it was one. It could have been one. I, I would have to research that and find out. But whether it was one or two or three, you know what? If you got the black ball, you, you weren't getting in. They, they sold you, gee, I'm sorry. Most of the time I had a large, you know, the fact who the sponsor was. Billy Bone was a well-respected. He was a lieutenant at the time. Later became captain and later suddenly tragically passed away from a heart attack on the way to work, on the way to the police station uh, a couple of years after I left Long Island, which was tragic. He left a wife and a couple of young young daughters, but he, I think he's gone 20 years now. But I always, I always think of Billy Bowen when I think of Mineola. And like I said, uh, three companies, 50 people each with waiting lists to get in. And you didn't have to put up a sign at, at, at the, on a mailbox or a sign at the bus stop saying, hey, you know, now we have pensions. You know, New York State, lots of states have them. It's not actually a pension, but it's a program. Every that, little bit helps. Right. And, and, and each company or district or whoever is administrative responsible collects the taxes. They put a certain amount of dollars per member per month into an account. It's really a financial investment. And then all the rules and regulations are, are, are set up where you have to perform. You have to make a certain amount of runs per month and, and stay active. And that, that's the whole goal. The whole goal is to keep people active. Also, the goal is retention, to keep people from leaving. So you get folks like myself. I'm 61 years old. I'll be chief for three years. Two, three, four. I'll be 64 years old. A lot of guys, ex-chief, 64 years old, they stop coming around. But if you keep coming around, then you keep getting money added to your to your pension check. And when you turn 62, I'll actually start collecting at 62. You, you get a defined benefit every month for the rest of your life. They also give you a little sweetener if you stay active. After you collect your pension, your monthly pension, if you stay active in spite of that, they give you another little monetary That's sweetener. So, awesome. And it's all very easily manageable. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some company somewhere that, in the country that maybe couldn't afford that. But that, that's the retention element of it. And, well, and you uh, said about works. the sign. Years ago, you never had to put the sign out, and now we have to put the sign on the thing. And, and you're right, because nowadays, and, and I'll even go take a step further, putting the blinking sign in front of the firehouse with the, where we, you know, we come volunteer, right. that's not even good enough. You have to be, you got to be on social media. And, and I said this, and we're going to talk a little more recruitment and retention here, but I, I've said this to my buddies before, you know, to a lot or to a lot of volunteer fire chiefs. Instead of trying to fill turnout gear, sometimes the best thing you do is grab three or four of your all stars. Maybe if it's a bigger department of five, but let's just shoot for three or four. God, the guys or gals that are there all the time, they're you know they're always dependable. You know how it's always the same folks that always show up right. for the meetings, for the picnics, right. for That's stuff. That's you give the you give a job to the busiest guy because yeah. they'll get it done. Well, you go to those people and you go, John, do me a favor, find me one more like you. A family member, church, little league team, neighbor, fine. And, and, and you know what? If only one of the three gets you a relative, one new member, and, and you might even want more of your nuclear stuff. You and, know and, I mean? and I'll tell you what happened. I, I, I expanded on that program, and, and, and I, I have not actually completed it yet. I was sort of waiting for some stuff until I became chief. And what I did was I sat down with, with Dawn, with my wife, and we sat down at the computer. And what we did was we wrote a little almost – it's going to be on a card, I believe, when I'm done. But it's almost a little personal invitation to join the South Bloomingdale Grove Fire Department. And it says that, South Bloomingdale Grove Fire Department, you have been selected by the members of the South Bloomingdale Grove to be offered a position with the fire department. Blah, blah, blah. And it goes on to say, not blah, 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 but it actually lists those things. There is a pension system. We have a weekly drill night. Training is free and provided to you at your own pace. Uh, you know, you get the volunteer for your community. There's, there's several positive things on that. And I would say, and, and your name was recommended to us by, and, I, and each guy gets to write his name on that card and his phone number because they're only going to hand it to somebody that they know. So I bring it home and I give it to my neighbor, Rick Lasky, who's a mechanic and lives across the street. I say, hey, Rick, you know, you know I'm going to fight upon, right? Yeah, how you doing? Listen, here's something. And you give him the card and he takes the card and he sees his name on it and he sees this nice professionally written sort of invitation, and he sees you. If you have any questions, please contact John Salka at, and the phone number's there, and he's like, this is an invitation. We don't we don't just take anybody. We go out and look for people, and, and you're one of the guys we'd love to have. And we're thinking we might be able to attract people in based on the fact that we want them. We invite idea. them. They have the skills that are valuable to us. And you, if you just hand one out, I, told, I don't hand them out to everybody. The best guy you know or the most eligible guy you know or gal, please hand it to them. And I said, if, if five guys or 10 guys, I'm going to hand them to everybody, but if five guys hand them out and three or two of the guys come in, that's a gigantic oh, plus. And, and you mentioned the whole the list on there, you know, the different things and so on and so forth. And I think I, I mentioned this to you before. 
I was at a, I was teaching at a particular fire department, right? And and the night before, you want to see the firehouse, sure, go in. And we're walking through the bay, and there's a you know a couple of tankers, or pumper, or ladder. And over here was a trailer, like a um, pub ed trailer kind of looking thing. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. It's like your safe house thing, you know, the right. whole thing we do it. And I look, I said, that's pretty. He goes, oh, that's our recruitment trailer. I said, what? He goes, we got that through a grant. We got that through a grant, and there's several organizations out there. Get a hold of the National Volunteer Fire Council. Get a hold of the National Fire dot org all right get a hold of national Volunteer fire they will point you in the right direction these guys got a grant job and it's a really nice like like almost like a pub ed trailer food trailer looks like like a food trailer it swings open yeah. and people can come up to the window right and it's all the wrap it's all wrapped really cool with the logos the scenery he goes we go to every friday night football game at the high school every festival everything we can get somebody comes gets with the fire pickup truck we drag it out there and it only takes a couple people around he goes we pull over on the side it's got a generator if we need it, if we can't plug in a power supply. He goes, we open up, you know, the awning comes up, boom. There's a smart TV hanging there. <clears throat> there's and they and they start the TV and there's a, a film that's reeled, you know, where it's pictures of them cutting with you know the jaws and you know, or the jaws right, and right, fire fighting activity, stuff. Yep. And so people walk up by and they're seeing the video of them fighting fires and doing stuff. And and then there's some 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 mock-ups, some static displays, some gear, and they have like a you know a, an axe. Maybe a Halligan, you pick up, and and right. you could put you look at helmet and the gear and a thermal imager and things or whatever, and they have all the brochures, and and it says and there's a check you know on his side it was a checkoff thing like you know do you want to serve your community do you want to make a difference do you want to be that person that they trained, point to in right. church that says you know what not only does he do that or she does that Shiva and all this and I went that is freaking awesome he goes yeah he goes we idea. drag it out and we're handing out and little little kids see it we had the little kids helmets you know why. Parents come with the little kids. Parents come with the little kids with the plastic helmets too, and the parents stand no. there. And a lot of them are watching that video. You go, hey, you want to know? You want to see? You want me to explain what's going on here? And they don't even know it's a recruitment drive or or trailer. And then they realize, and that's that brings me the other thing about doing like open houses. I know it's a lot of work every year during fire prevention month or whatever. When you open house, you clean up the place and you show off your rigs, and people come and you know you do all the de demonstrations. You know that's a great way to recruit. Another one is. Every year or so, do a Citizens Fire Academy. I, I know there's a lot of work with that, with eight weeks or ten, whatever, but I can't tell how many places, John, where people, when they go to graduate to Citizens Fire Academy, and they go, so, Chief, what what, what do I have to do to, like, to be a volunteer? And you go, funny you should ask that. A little bit more that you just went through for eight months, you know, and there's the buy-in because they've already went through the whole Citizens Fire Academy. Very few of them join and go, oh, you know what, I don't have the time. You just spent... All this time going, you know, one and, night. And you, you're sort of wetting their appetite a little bit. Yeah. You know, if they're not into it, they might just stray away and not even finish that. But if they stay to the end, that that alone, you know, sort of exposes the but, fact that they're interested. But think about the trailer. Think of all the things you could do there. Oh, absolutely. You know, idea. if you just went to the Friday night football games, what's the fire part? And I, I just, God, I thought that was such a great and idea. There's lots of places to go, especially in rural areas, but everywhere. You can go to the farmer's markets on Saturday. You can go to the Friday night football games. You can go to the car show at the high school parking lot. Long, you know, find, Very few places are going to deny the volunteer fire department an opportunity to set their trailer up in the vicinity of whatever activity they have going on to uh, to recruit new members oh. for the volunteer fire service. Now, don't you have to – you you be in chief again now there um, – we talk a lot in our leadership classes. We use the word in different, several different places, empathy. And we talked before about, you know, understand that everybody has stuff going on in their lives. And that there was a time when John and Dawn, early in their life, their marriage, had little babies, little kids at home, five kids. Cool. And sports and demands and things. And you might not be able to make every call. You might not be able to make every drill night. Your thoughts because I know where I feel like this, you know, that I think people, need, I think you need to be flexible. I think too many volunteer outfits run good people off because they're at a point in their life where they, they went from, man, they were there to where I, I'm just barely making it. Don't give up. I mean, you know what? I'm sorry, but we just can't use anymore. Right. You know, it's right. not getting rid of the old guy that can't go inside more. I'm like, yep. you can't use a safety officer, a driver, the firehouse, the guy, because the Fire firehouse makes a coffee, yeah. everything. Right. You know, talk about that, and the I empathy agree. you have to have that. I think now modern-day volunteer fire services have to adjust that a little bit. I think rather than, you know, strictly adhering to minimum standards of response times and meetings and stuff like that, I think people have to be given 
and I th and again, I I think it's a social and a cultural shift that's going on in our country, and I, and I can't identify it or name it, but I think people have to be, you know, fire services, even even volunteers, especially volunteers, you have to be a little bit more flexible with the folks that are that are donating their time, because number one, life is just busier now. I think yeah. I think life is more complicated, even for young kids, and there whether was, it's technology. There was, no, there was no hitting lessons for my daughter, like when I was growing up, there was nobody giving hitting lessons for girls who are playing softball right. guys. Now you, you did it in the backyard or you did it on a Saturday morning with your yeah, own. Yeah, now there's all this extra. There's all stuff. this organized stuff all over the place. Even even when my kids are growing up and they're all in their early thirties and late twenties now. Um, we used to tell each of the five children, you, you pick one sport. You you can't go to two and she go to two and he goes to two. And there's not enough of us here to drive everybody around. So you know he wanted to play soccer, she wanted to play soccer, he wanted to play baseball, and that's what they did. So even back then there was a lot of stuff going on, but now there's even more going on. Never mind technology and all these social media platforms and stuff like that. And everybody's involved in more. So life being busier, I think volunteer fire departments, they might even have to change the numbers a little bit. It doesn't what does it cost you to keep a firefighter that's instead of doing fifty percent, he only does forty. Now that's ten percent from the historical cutoff. But you know what? If that gets me six more guys or gals, six more volunteer firefighters in my in my ranks. But they can only do even thirty. That, or that 40%. could be the difference between getting the engine out or right. not getting out during the right. day or at four. And they're not showing up person. as much. They're not showing up to 50, 60, 70 percent like the real active members. The other thing is sometimes people show up and they can only give thirty five and just barely making forty. So you hang on to them. You, you you say for the first year or two we're flexible because you're just getting to know us. Number one, it may just light their fire. They may say, "Wow, I'm going to spend a little more time at the firehouse. I'm not going to do that." that Saturday craft show anymore. I'm going to go to the firehouse on Saturdays now. And number two, like I said, if you keep a little, a few more people around, eventually it may grow. The 30% may turn to 40, may turn to 50 naturally as they get a little bit more familiar. So I, I think some adjustments, some flexibility is 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 due, is warranted at the fire department and to keep keep members a little bit longer. And you're seeing some pretty cool incentives out there. Um, I know uh, out in Oregon, um, we were, they were giving me a little tour of them out there, and here's the firehouse, kind of in a more rural setting a little bit. And right next door was like a four unit, really nice four unit, you know, like apartment building, like one story. And they go, "That's for us." I go, "What? You know what? You you dedicate yourself. You make so many calls. You can live there rent free. You you know, pay utilities. We live there, and you're right here at the firehouse. Right. Just make an effort. You got to keep the higher, maybe the higher standard, the higher minimum." Well, and but I, there's the reward. And I know there was a department in New Jersey where it was pretty expensive to live there. But when the city would go out and grab a house for somebody that's, you know, evicted somebody back in their tax, they'd let you live there to help ensure the response time. And and I know the county, I know Calvert County for the longest time, but there was a bunch of them that, that were in Maryland and some other places where if you were a member of good standing for two years, now you could start there as, as 16 years old as a volunteer. Member of, in good standing for two years they pay for your college, not for you to go away. Right. But if you were going to go to college, university, Local right community there, college or whatever university, if it was right there, the one guy I was with was a lieutenant in the Senate Capitol Police. He goes, "So I got my bachelor's and how I got my master's." I said, "Well, I said, God, that's got to cost you guys a lot of money." There's 49 departments in the county. I said, "Paying for their college goes books and tuition." Here, here, and I said, "How much is that?" He goes, "Well, I think the most we spent one year in the county." Was like 150 grand. He goes, no, that seems like a lot of money. Four nine departments. He goes, and here's our return. If we do that for you, you have to make so many calls and you have to spend so many nights in our firehouse. You have to do, you have to come here and spend the night and make sure the rig gets. If we're doing that for you, right. you got to show. He goes, we never have a problem getting the rigs out anymore. And he goes, think of the drop in a hat. He goes, we can never be career here. We do not have the economy to support career a career departments. Not as it'll never happen. In our wildest dreams, but like 150 grand is a drop. When you look at budgets of personal re related people, money well spent. Oh my god! And I'm like, and then you look at it, and and you can even do it like what you did when when you were not recruiting but hiring new firefighters in uh, uh, down in Texas, Louisville. You know, you hire people with certain qualifications, or they they would come in. Remember, you, you trained them, and if if they left right away, you sent them all the training. Oh. And if they left the next year, they had to pay back a certain amount of the of the training, right? Well, you could do a very similar thing with the college. So we're going to pay for your college. You know, it takes you a couple of years to get your degree. And once you get two years of college or three years of college, you have to stay two or three more years. That's the minimum for you to stay. And otherwise, they have to sign in a contract that they'll reimburse 
they'll reimburse the college well, fund if they just get the college and run. And I right? asked him, John, I asked him, I said, so how many people stay after they get, he goes, almost everybody. I go, yeah. what? He goes, unless they get a job and they get transferred to California. Right. right. He goes, and he walked around going, and he was pointing for people that got their degrees and they stayed. You know, I thought, I, I was just like going, God, what a great idea. Aspen, Colorado, our good friend Rick Ballantyne, the chief there. Aspen, Colorado. Um, I don't know if they still do it, but up, up till not too long ago, if you remember a good Stanley, one year you got your health insurance paid. Health insurance paid for you. Wow. All right. Yeah, that's health dramatic. insurance. Now there's something that's, that, that affects your whole life, not just your And, and the family. And, and I said, how? He goes, you know what? He goes, I know I've got a couple guys that do it just for that. He goes, but I get calls out of them. They, right. get, they have to show up. You can't, on the rig. We you get, can't get it guys. not show up. Yeah. yeah. So And junior firefighters, now that we're on this whole roll here, uh, junior firefighters, we used to have a very big junior firefighter program. You know, explorers, they're called all different things in different places. But we had these young firefighters, you know, 16 years old, et cetera, not old enough to be senior members, not old enough to come in the firehouse at night, not old enough to go even on the rigs or, or the fires, but we started breaking them in. And, and, and you know, explorers is, a, is a, an, an arm of the Boy Scouts, but we just simply had uh, Sapling Grove junior firefighters. I think about six chiefs, six past chiefs in my fire department started out as junior firefighters, right? As an explorer. Right. At, at one point, we had... I think 15 or 18 junior firefighters, many of which, a majority of which, I don't know the number, ended up becoming ordinary senior firefighters, and then some went on to be officers. Some are still members of the department. Now, obviously, the drawback to junior firefighters is they're young boys, and they're joining, and girls, and they're joining, you know, in high school. And some of them join and stay, and then some of them are just kids, and then they go away to college, and we never see them again. You know, they stay, they keep their membership, and they come back for Christmas, and they come back for the summer, and then a year later, they say, you know what, I'm going to have to gonna have to resign um, I'm going you know full-time in Colorado or in Florida or whatever and that's fine we still get two or three years out of them and we train them and some of those folks end up coming back and saying hey I'm, I'm a firefighter where I live now because of the experience I got here so sometimes the advantage is us and sometimes the advantage ends up being some other fire department down the road well how many times have we talked about that where, where we run into a guy or gal it's a chief or a train officer and they're all frustrated because like it seems like every time we train them they leave and go to a career or another department. I'm like, and, and I said, well, it goes back to that. Worry about the things you can fix, not the things you can't. And yeah. the point being, you know, it's all how you look at it. You know, number one, the first thing you do, be complimented that you put another good, you produced another good young firefighter. It's, it's a uh, uh, officer and gentleman, Louis Gossett Jr. Breaking in long hair, all these new people. And when they're done, they're graduate. And he's, he's down the street, welcoming the next group all over all again. Over again. And he's producing a product so be proud that you put someone out there. Right. The other part, like I said, you know, if you have those people that are leaving like that quick, do the proration stuff. Every class, we every your gear, your uniform, the stuff we issue that you're going to wear out or wear, and your schooling. If you leave, like you said, if you leave within a year, it's 100 percent you pay us back. Two years is 75, three is 50, 25, and then it's gone. Right. And and you know what? If they want to leave, and it, so maybe you do that. And I said, I said because he said that they hurt my budget. I go well then. Be creative with your financing right. and how you get that money back. So I, I, I just a lot of it comes down to leadership, who you've got. And a lot of know. it is really minimal. I mean, I have to look at my volunteer fire department. And taking a new member in is, is not a very expensive proposition at all. Uh, we have gear already in the firehouse. They're not taking it home and leaving town with it. They're using it. They turn it back if they leave. We give them a radio. They turn it back if they leave. The training is not is not paid for. We don't pay for training. It's all covered by the state of New York through the Orange County Fire Training Center. So that's scheduled, well, and they go up there. So, I mean, we buy the book. So they're going to have to buy a five out of one book or something like that. So it's a minimal monetary investment. But budget-wise, I, I know you've been very creative over the years. I mean, you drove all the way, like, across New York State. You drove to Buffalo. To dr Buffalo, which is not, like, around the corner, to get your guys new used gear. Right. Gear, you know, some places, like Louisville, you keep, you know, it's three, four years. You keep your set. You get a second set. And it, there was a point we were getting rid of some pretty good sets of gear. And now through the Forest Service, there, they do the warehousing. They come pick it up. And if you're a volunteer fire department, you can write out a little request, a grant, that we need we need 30 sets of gear. And these are the side. They go, approved, come and get your stuff. And you're right. getting stuff that's like. Well, we got real life stuff that was not, you know, some of it was 10 years old. Some of it was a little over 10 years old. But having having said that. You 10 know, years old, not wore that much. Right. Okay. Some of them were 10 years old in a bag, you know, hardly worn at all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, but it, it worked out right. And so there's a lot of, you know, people say the volunteer fire department, they just think, oh, poo-poo, you know, volunteer fire department. The guys just come, they, they come from their homes, they come from the pool, they jump on a rig, they go to the fire, they come back. 
they're, they're, they're every bit as much of a fire department as any other fire department, minus the paychecks, minus the pensions, minus the full-time issues. But all the other stuff is there, the training and the apparatus and the maintenance and checking other rigs and, and the facilities and going on runs. And, and then you have this added thing that the career departments generally don't have. You got to keep replacing people all the time, or certainly to some degree, uh, which career departments often don't have to worry about. You hire people and they stay for their 20 years or 30 years and, and then off out the door they go. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about it for you. I just want to be out there, go to some calls with you. Yeah, I got to go with some other calls. Your other fire you car, did. and I which, went to calls with you at your place. Which, as well. which, if if you've never been in a NASCAR before, go with him to a call. We're just no, getting no. the car. No, it no. is like just buckle up, put your helmet on, I'm chin very strap. Safe. I'm very you know, safe. I respond very safe. Strap in, be ready, take some Valium, and you're good to go. No, I'm kidding, but but now that's it. It's exciting. Good, good, good for you. Um. We were talking about stuff out here, John. Um, uh, All about on the on the on the big, exhibit floor. Yeah, big, big, t a lot of new stuff, um, and we're going to talk about it Thursday. But as well, I, I'm sure I'm going to bring it up. But uh, we both love the fire service. We love our we love it more than life itself. We love our families come first. We love the fire service, and, and, and everybody knows you and I know that. However, sometimes we have those in the fire service. I call them the, to the extreme people, like you know, it's it's. You know, being the hazmat geek that I was, I used to say the same thing when it came to like labor negotiation management. You're, you're down, obviously, you're, 7.0 is, is the neutral and the, you know, on, on the asset scale, right? It's neutral for, for an asset. So you're down here, you have an asset spill, and you start adding a neutralizing agent. It keeps going up, you get closer to seven, closer to seven, and you get there where you should stop because now it's back to normal neutral, but you keep going. And you go from an asset to a base, you go from one hazmat to another. Sometimes, I think we create our own muck in an I effort to do. fix. I know. I mean, do. here's this big gigantic ball of stuff, and it takes us like a year or two or three or four years or five years sometimes to get it down to where it needs to be. And I think that's what, look. You and I are huge proponents of cancer awareness. Cancer, get tested, get checked every year. Safety, our good, survival, our good buddy Bill. The... We talk about Bill Carey. Bill right. Carey's like, if right. you don't, if you don't, if you don't do checkups, you don't check. What, 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 what do you, I, you know. All right, we don't use some words like that, but I'm just saying. So we're all about cancer awareness. We're all about, and, and it is a fact. We're not breathing the same stuff my old dad, my old man did in the 50s and 60s. There was, there, the, you, you mentioned something the other day. I started laughing because the whole legacy furniture thing, and I'm like, I remember Mike Lombardo saying, "I looked at pictures when I was growing up. We weren't sleeping on on, on rocks, stones, and hemp and straw. There were foam with it. Now, look around this room." But, Lot diff lot of lot of different things here. Nowadays, when you look at what we're doing, it's really not smart to breathe in smoke. It's real, but we're in a we're in a business and a job that puts us in dangerous situations. And with all the stuff, John, we're gonna talk about like clean cabs and that. I'm true, I'm just I'm a big believer, and I think it's start anything starts with the individual first. Accountability on the fire ground, whatever. You know what? Training, get, get into the job, right? You don't you don't have to uh Stay, be ready if you stay ready, right? That's, That's what you're right, saying. Right. So that being said, you same have, thing. You don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Well, That's let's right. try a little bit better hygiene. I don't mean deodorant. I'm talking, you know what? Keep your gear clean when you can. You know, when you get done, clean up a little bit. Why get get? You know, the the coolness of having burnt helmets and black sh out of your nose and stuff. Right, right. You know, just how about we do that a little bit? And I said this as a paramedic for a long time. Our ambulance says. We caught on to that with the whole bloodborne pathogens things a long time ago. Let's stop making we let's put non permeable material and so you can wipe things down and clean things Hold and liquids down. instead of we're putting in these cloth seats that are embroidered in fire engines and right. you you get in with your gear. But John, here's my question for you because you're up there where it snows and I mean I'm down in Texas, but when I was up in the Chicagoland area and they had another winter in the Midwest this year. So aside from the departments that have like unlimited budgets, because we issue two sets of gear, and th this is my question is, how, I mean, I don't know how easy it's going to be for a department that let's say they're allowed to actually wear their gear to a fire instead of having to get dressed there, put their air pack on there. Now, before they get the rig or come home, they have to take their gear off and put it in this bag and put in this thing. So the clean kit, you're all sweaty. I know I was, I'm all sweaty fighting a fire to cold. I, we don't all have warming buses. Or replay, play, where do you change when it's like 15 degrees or 20 outside? And what do you wear? I left my boots, my shoes on the floor of the apparatus room. I didn't bring, oh, here's your spare clothes when you get changed. I, I just, I understand if folks, I'm not, like I, I started by saying, I know John, 
and I know I am huge in preventing cancer and being aware, but, you know, I, I, I like the idea, John, with the SCBAs. I like that, that some of the companies have done it where when you get back all metal, you could take the softies off, go and you put them and you, you, you wash them or send them off or do your thing like you would, and you put, once you clean the air pack, the metal stuff is good, you put clean pads on. So, And I'm like, now, see, there's someone right. thinking at least you could take that and put up. And, and but, that's not a problem. That's but, just a maintenance but How do you, I mean, I'm just sitting there going. Listen, I, I think obviously the intent is, is certainly not malicious and it's certainly not negative in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I, I think we had some conversations earlier today and yesterday about people. So I think the intention is good. And, and, and the road to hell is paved in good intentions. I mean, th that thing didn't come out of nowhere. A lot of, a lot of things get, get messed up and, and, and mixed up and, and, and sent spiraling out of control because somebody wants to do something that has the best of intentions. So I'm not even going to talk about intentions because I don't think there's any question about intentions. Right. Everybody's intentions are good. Nobody wants cancer. Nobody wants Nobody's being malicious with right. preventing Nobody cancer. Nobody wants to bring cancer on their, you know, bring cancer. Nobody wants to bring debris or, dirt or, or, you know, home to their home or anything. Guys used to bring their laundry home and clean and, and wash their uniforms at home. Nobody even does that anymore. We have wash machine as most do in the firehouse now for gear. Now it's most of it's sent out contract. Even the FDMY, we have two sets of gear. You know, twice a year they come in and bundle up everybody's gear and take it out, bring it back literally in plastic, like like it came out of the dry cleaner. But my point is, this whole clean cab idea is, number one, I don't know where it came from. And I, I know the manufacturers are great people. They're, they're filling up the apparatus floor here. They're, they're, they're probably, you know, financing, paying for much of this conference. And I understand that's the way this business The vendors runs. are all, they've always been awesome. Right. Yeah. Now, having said that, now having said that, I don't know who came up with this idea of clean cabs whole gigantic systems within the apparatus. It isn't just, oh, you don't go in the rig anymore. They're built different. They have special ventilation systems on them now and everything else, separate cabs that have vacuums in them that, that pull up. I'm, I'm really not sure where this came from. There's a lot of things that have been come up in the last couple of years that were, that were solutions in search of a problem. You know, they, they came up with these great ideas. Now, now we have these gigantic new rigs, you know, the clean cab concept. And I think some things, as, as we all know, have been done in the past. I think some things are pushed by... Um, a, a, the folks that sell them. I think they invent some stuff to address something that's maybe not a major problem, but it turns out to be a gigantic solution to a moderate problem. I, I and I think I'm saying the same thing you said. I think they're just overdoing it a little bit. I think, you know, paying more attention to when you contaminated and decontaminating yourself properly and quickly, maybe, maybe storing contaminated gear somewhere else for a while. But again, like you said, now we have weather factors and snow and temperature. And what what about service? What about them. What about all those people out there that all of us exist for? All those ladder trucks, all those engines, every paid and volunteer fire department, everything that happens really happens to protect the citizens, whether it's citizens working, whether it's people driving through. What about them? So so an engine and a truck in, in, in Nowhereville, America, and they have three engines and one truck, and they have a little house fire, one room fire. They put it out very quickly that morning at eight o'clock in the morning, and now they're going back to the firehouse, and now it's the clean cab concept. Nope. You guys crawl through there. You got soot. You got carbon. You got all these things that we think are carcinogens, and very well maybe. So when you come out, now I see them hosing everybody down. So now everybody's first set of gear is soaking wet, which we know is not very safe to, as a firefighter, and probably not effective, and, and probably not usable. So now we wash them down. We clean them. They take their gear off. They put it. It's July, so that's okay. They ride back to the firehouse out of service because they don't have any protective gear anymore. They ride back to the firehouse out of service now to get their second set of gear. Maybe, maybe the new rigs will have a the second set of gear on the rig. Maybe there's a little closet, and they can take their second dry set out and go back. My point is, isn't going back in service very important? So now you fight one fire. The first one you fought some places in, in months, and now you're out of service until you go back to the firehouse and, and re-gear yourself. Some towns can't afford that. Some fire departments only have three rigs. Well, and John, and I, I, like I said, I'm not against – the thought process and the ideas, because that's how we get better. Let's right. come up with some right. some of the craziest ideas, but some of our great things. That's how my thing is. We can't. We give no disrespect. You and I very much respect law enforcement. You know how partial I am to them. We says for we give billions and billions and billions of dollars a year. God bless them to law enforcement, homeland security. Just look up how much money we get for the fire service. To AFG grass safer. Just look at how much money, how Fraction. little it is. Fraction. And 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 I'm like, once you know, so if you've done budgets, if you've been a fire chief, you know what I'm talking about. You know, unfunded mandates are tough for anybody. We're trying to do. We can't even get radios for everybody. 
we can't get, you know, I mean, there's certain things, let alone some of this. Uh, my That's my question. It's great ideas. Let, let's just say all that. You know what? I was amazed. All my When I was hanging with the Dallas Stars, my good buddy, Marty Turkle, the goalie, D Dave Supernaut, when they built their brand new, the state-of-the-art brand new training facility, they had the changing locker room that you come in, you change out of your personal clothes, you put your stuff on. Then you went into your where all that gear was. Right. Well, hockey gear is some of the most god awful, oh. smelling, horrible stuff. My son, oh my god! And you, there's no way. So they hang, they put all their stuff in that room, and when they leave, all right, and they get, they close up the doors. It's sealed the room. They turn this thing on. You come in the next day, you can't smell. No, it's gone. It's like magic. So you know what? Maybe there is a system. If, if the fire chiefs say, I want a system that will suck this stuff out before we breathe, you know, like they did that, every little bit helps. But it goes back to when fire chiefs actually demand that things be taken care of. You and I have said before, wear the seatbelts. If you're not wearing, seriously, if you're not wearing your seatbelt nowadays, you're a fool. What could you be thinking? Okay. Now, let's talk to the half of that. Let's get the manufacturers to stop making seatbelts that are almost the same size as air pack belts. And then what they do, they they, they add extenders. Well, that how about something big and meaty for a glove? You can you and I could go to Six Flags over Great America. We can go Six Flags, get on a Mr. Freeze or Superman ride that goes like 150 miles an hour. What do you do? You sit down, it does what? And they upside down, backwards, all and you don't fuck. You mean to tell me that if we said, look, I need you to design a pumper that if I get it with my gear, my stuff, it goes doof. And, and we're good. Right. And there, and there's, or, or you pull something down or whatever it is. If you put it in drive, it won't go unless those things go doof. And there you go. If, if we don't tell them and demand from them what we want, you know, like I said, get rid of the – if you're worried about bringing stuff back, get rid of the – because my thing is the big question is, well, now what do we do with our hose? We got to, you know, where do we wash our hose that's all set up, gear and stuff like that. And, and, and we're, folks – We're not talking about – we're not talking about radioactive poison here. We're talking about – soot from fires. We're talking about ordinary contaminants of combustion. We're not talking about highly volatile, you know. And, and a lot of this product. is, I understand the whole carcinogen thing, like you said before. My thing is, I'm, I'm almost like, in my head, I'm going, God, I can't wait to see for five years from now we this took goes. this to get at this. Just like... I know. was thinking vacuums. I was thinking if every fire apparatus had a vacuum. Vacuum built into it somewhere. You hit the button, the big hose comes off. You vacuum a guy down after a fire, all the loose stuff, all the particles, helmet, helmet, coat, gloves, everything. One guy vacuums one guy, the other guy does the other guy. Everything gets vacuumed off. And then, and then you know what? They take some stuff off, and then they have some, you know, not the little ones you use at the house, but these a, a big thing of wipies, you know, c c commercial wipies. Wipe the helmets down. Wipe the face pieces down. And and, and then maybe I – was, I was kidding before, but quite – maybe they should have a compartment on every rig. The three guys on the rig, their second set of gear goes on the rig. You put your work set on in the compartment, and you put your second set in, in the second set compartment. And if you do have a job that day, this stuff goes in there. You take your clean gear out. You're ready to go. When you leave, you can take another run in. And what's the chance that we have another fire to start with? But if you did, at least you're in your second gear. Ready. I mean, there are. I think there are some simple solutions without changing apparatus, without building new kinds of apparatus. I think we can do that. You can't keep the firemen out of there. They're the guy that's sweated up. They're still going to have some soot on them. You can't tell them, you guys walk back to the firehouse. We'll meet you there. We don't want you in the rig. So I guess instead of building whole new rigs with, with gigantic systems on, on maybe something as simple as a vacuum and another compartment to keep a spare set of gear. We keep everything else on that rig. Three or four sets of gear is not going to weigh the rig down, right? I don't know. Maybe well, those simple ideas. Maybe we have and, to just go a little simpler. And that's why I said years and years ago, I was a paramedic for a long time. You know, when I went to a paramedic school in 1982, if they told me when, when I certified – when we after years after that, they said you guys start wearing latex gloves. Okay, you guys start wearing latex gloves. I'm like, other people start. I can't feel the vein. I can't start an IV. Right, right. I'm Any like, excuse. Now I won't touch anybody without a glove. You know what I'm saying? Right, I mean that kind of right. stuff. You wouldn't even and you and they come right off as soon as you use. Them. And then you look at the guy. Now you have gloves on. You're in the back of the ambulance. You're all full of all this stuff. All the, and you all the bloodborne pathogens. And what happens? The guy gets out, goes in the front seat, and he drives the ambulance with the same gloves on. And and the back of ambulances. In a lot of cases, are filthy. We never even got past that, but we made them where you can clean them: the walls, the seats, the handles, right. everything. Easily, you maintained. could go through with a bucket of bleach and stuff, and you could scrub this stuff. It is not smart to take your shitted up gear and put it in the back seat of your pickup truck where your kids sit. You know, we Homer Homer talked about for, for Fort Worth. 
about bringing bed bugs back to the firehouse at the oh, bottom yeah. of your boots oh, yeah. and then bringing them home and stuff like because the eggs are on the bottom and stuff like that. And just, you know, and they were testing the washers for the side of the rigs for your bottom of your boots, your cuffs, kind of like one was a spinning wheel with water. That was a, a, a high pressure spray that you, you kind of back up like a, with your hoof, right, your hoof, right. you put your boot up and, psh, and knocked off the lumps. You know, and now they hold. I'm not a scientist. The big debate where they walk through the big ring and it's high pressure, like water, is actually pushing it further in. And some, what? No, you not get. all of them. But some of the wipes you're rubbing into your skin, and you know we're pushing. We're sitting in steam. Where you're you're actually pushing it in instead of taking it out. So I just think there's so much, John. And again, folks, don't do not take. We are huge advocates. For what we're trying to do with cancer the prevention awareness, we're, we're, and Can, we're, cancer you know, sucks. Agreeing. I'm just like, I guess you got to figure out on this side of the table what is realistic and what isn't realistic. Right. And and, it's not just and cancer. Come in the middle. It's cancer and illness and sickness. You know, you can bring contaminants home that just make you sick. Doesn't have to be something that kills you. Yeah, that's that, that's all good that we're trying to protect ourselves. I think we just have to refine. I think we have to refine the search pro process. Number one and number two. I don't think that the first guy that comes up with an idea, we have to order 500 of them. And, right. and, and mandate them for the whole country. I think some things have to be done. That's what happened after 9-11. Oh, white powder scares. Everybody had to go out and buy their face pieces real quick. And neighboring departments, in t where I was at, departments right next door, they're in such a hurry to go buy their masks. Nobody's masks were interchangeable. The kit, I mean, And you know what? We have some organizations in the United States, great organizations, you know, NIOSH and NFPA and all sorts of other people that have that play a different role in our system. And I was just having a discussion with some firefighters out there on, on the uh, in the hallway about uh, live fire training. Ah, we really don't do live fire training. The NFPA stuff is still limiting. You know, concrete buildings, two pallets and one piece of hay, three cubic feet by two cubic feet. You know, we don't even bother doing it anymore. So even not, and I'm saying to myself, so who's building these standards? Why, why don't we amend the standards to make to make what we want to do a little bit more realistic? You know. We're totally away from the cancer thing now. We're just talking about training now for a minute. You know, NFPA standard on live fire should maybe be different. Maybe that has to be modified. Maybe there needs to be some more input from the folks that are doing the job in the field rather than just saying, here's what you got to do now, and now you got to comply with it. You know, I mean, every first every first effort or every first edition of whether it be an NFPA standard or training or how to solve the, the, the clean cab concept, every first edition doesn't necessarily have to be the one that's adopted and mass produced. I think we need to – Evolve a little bit, you know. Well, and, and you know, lastly, here, uh, as we as we're kind of fishing up, keep the conversation going, keep talking. That's how we get better. That's how the fire started. We used to be on horses, right? You know, we used to pull stuff behind us with hose. You know, look how look out there, look how far we've come. So, and that little and that little sign I looked at on Facebook that I showed you on my computer before about sometimes the safest thing is competence rather than worrying about systems and equipment and washing and drying, sometimes just competence, sometimes just knowing what you're doing and maybe how to stay out of some trouble inside, how to, how to not roll around in the dirt all day long and stuff like that, you know, all part of it. Hey, here we are, FDIC 2019. Um, uh, we, 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 we tell you every time we visit with you, if you're looking to get a hold of John, you want to come out and teach a class or do some consulting for you or information, firecommandtraining.com. Uh, is the best way to get a hold of him. He's got all his information, numbers, and things like that. For me, it's pridenotorship.com. It's got everything on there. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, sometimes it may take us a little bit to get back to you because we get a lot of stuff. But He's we... talking about me. It takes <laughs> me a while. <laughs> it just takes us a little while because we try to answer everything. Absolutely. So if, if you're here at FDIC and you're watching this later on, the tape version, you know, it's it's the great – it's it's Disney World for firefighters. Instead of mouse ears, we have helmets on. If you've never been here – you Enjoy. need to get here. And you if you see us, here. make sure you, you shout. Give us a shout and say hello. Hey, let's say it again. All right. You know, we want you to be safe and please keep in your thoughts and prayers the men and women serving our armed forces. They're making it all happen for you for us. Thank you and God bless you. Be careful.